It's a new video for a well very interesting manga that you'll like too. If you like this video, you will give it a like and comment and I will release the next part especially for you. This video is a compilation of four previously published parts, plus a fifth part at the end that has not been published separately. Chapter 1 Two buddies were walking out of the Donggang High School building, one stubbier and with glasses, and the other taller, sturdy built, and they were discussing the recent exam, and how they were bored sitting through the rest of the class, quickly finishing their assignments. Suddenly, there was excitement and cheering in the crowd of students who were also walking after class. A convoy of military vehicles was rushing down the road, but inside the open truck sat not soldiers, but teenagers in tuxedos. The guy with the glasses told his friend to pay attention to the logos a school of heroes. It all started suddenly, no foreshadowing. According to scientific facts that came to light later, there was an Earth-like planet in stellar space. But because of the catastrophe, that world was blown to pieces. The debris flew to us and changed the usual laws of our world beyond recognition, the phenomenon was called fusion. Thus, about 17% of the Earth's territory was under the control of ruthless monsters, which appeared as a result of the merger. The areas they inhabit have come to be called dungeons. To fight the uninvited guests, even outstanding human forces were not enough, but, fortunately, a solution was found. Not only did the invasion of the monsters bring cataclysms, but the innate limitations and capacity restrictions inherent in humans were removed. While this affected all earthlings, everyone had their own abilities, and those who stood out the most, through training and hardening, were able to fully master and utilize their power. They organized an elite force to regain control of the dungeon zones, and began calling themselves hunters. The entire world shuddered at their accomplishments and power. Even before the end of the first generation, schools were founded to educate future hunters. However, the best of them was considered the educational institution that had been producing successful defenders for 20 years, the Hero High School, known throughout the world. The crowd cheered again, because this time the schoolgirls noticed in one of the trucks a beautiful young man with snow-white skin and pointed back ears. When they asked their friend who he was, the glasses-wearing student was surprised because he was one of the most famous students of the hero school, Chai Dayo. His father was the best hunter, his mother is an elf, and they say that he is a genius, he is predicted to become a glorious warrior after graduation. However, what he heard did not impress the guy he thought that the fans of this half-elf were just crazy. The bespectacled boy turned to another student, Jang Ryong, who was standing in front of him and asked him if he would go to the party that Li Yun Jin had organized. The classmate, citing his part-time job refused. Another teenager poked Ryong in the back, telling him to hang back. Jang Ryong said goodbye and walked away. He received a receipt on his phone from the hospital for unpaid treatment for May and June. Then another message from an unknown caller saying that an order had arrived. Seeing the young man, the half-elf felt something strange, but thought it was just a hunch. Chang Ryong went down to the ruined subway station where he was met by a guy named him Jae Hwan and told to say hello to the customer. Standing next to the young man was a short bald man in a business suit and some big guy, apparently a bodyguard. Suddenly the customer lashed out at Huang, accusing the latter of deceiving him by promising to show him the most capable, but Jay countered that he was the most capable. This infuriated the businesslike man even more, and he ordered the brat to be removed at once and a normal man brought in, or both would be handicapped. The insult hurt Chan, and he turned to the big man, asking if he had been a hunter before, and then laughing that such a big man worked for such a small uncle. The bald man asked again, but the guard told the boss there was no point in talking, he should just break the freak's legs. Li Pil Gyu, that was the former hunter's name, was a silver-ranked warrior and had cleared 81 dungeons. His boss gave the young man one last chance to ask for forgiveness, but in return, he heard that it would be a cost. They didn't even realize that Chang Ryong had 371 illegally traversed dungeons to his credit, and he himself was already an experienced smuggler at the age of 17. Chapter 2. When the hunters successfully clear the dungeon, they receive very valuable rewards. But before taking out the treasures, they need to be checked, for among these treasures are things with immense power. If they are outside without proper control, they can be used for dangerous purposes. Therefore, the Hunters Association keeps a close eye on this and collects the appropriate tax. 
but there are also those who break this rule, they bribe hunters who don't want to pay high taxes and sneak the jewels out of the dungeons. If they are not caught, the society might be in chaos, at least that's what the authorities think, that's why they encourage citizens to report smugglers to the association. The bald man suddenly became nervous and asked the broker if he was going to intervene in the emerging conflict. Jay Huan asked the customer why he was suddenly scared, but he heard threats in response. It turns out that the big guy resigned not because of an injury, but because of the incident of beating up a co-worker. Chang Ruyong pretended to be surprised by what he heard, but his opponent said it was a minor freak, he was just getting rid of the trash. The young man laughed at Pilgyu for beating up a guy he thought was trash and being proud of it. The boogeyman got tired of listening to the taunts and tried to punch, but Chan dodged it by simply tilting his head. The former hunter got angry and pounced on the guy, but Ryung hit the huge foe right in the head with a powerful leg kick. From there, Li Pilgyu just endured blow after blow. He thought he was some cocky kid, but his reflexes and the power of his punches indicated that he was a real professional. Huang reminded the customer that he had promised to show him the most capable one. What he saw amazed the man sure, it was obvious that the teenager was a good fighter, but to knock Gyu off balance with a single blow was amazing. Jay smiled, assuming that his interlocutor's bodyguard used to be a tank. The bulging eyes made it clear that the young man was not mistaken. After the fusion, people had acquired skills beyond their capabilities. Each person's physique and abilities are different so the skills are also different. Hunters are trained individually, depending on their skills. During the mop-up, everyone had their own role, among them were the so-called tanks. They rushed forward and fought monsters personally, their bodies were so strong that they could withstand even a bullet hit. And the strongest tanks could even become a kind of shield that couldn't even withstand aerial bombs. Li Pilgyu used his skills to increase the characteristics by several times. He swung around and hit the stone floor with force, creating a wave, but Chan jumped up in time to avoid the attack. Then the big man struck again, breaking through the wall behind the young man. He was laughing now, asking why Ryan wasn't using his tricks now. The boy wasn't an idiot, so he didn't rush into the trap. Huang was surprised by Li's strength if his fist reached its target, his opponent wouldn't have a single whole bone left. The broker shouted to Chan to finish faster, if the tank blasted anything else in the room, his paycheck would be cut. The bully chuckled the young man didn't seem to fully understand his ward situation. Lee suggested that the young man tell Huang that his skills would not be enough to defeat a true professional, but Chan was not about to give up. Because of their superior resilience and endurance, people used to think that tanks are invincible, but this is not true. This class has its own weaknesses and enemies, to cope with which they cannot cope. Those who can concentrate enormous power in one point for example, a demiage dealer whose skill surpasses that of tanks by several levels. Chan picked up a piece of metal pipe from the ground and swung it at his opponent who intended to launch a leaping attack. With a rumbling sound, Li fell to the ground, unable to even move. The defeated big man asked her the smuggler had learned this twisting technique, and although Chan Ryong pretended not to understand what technique he was talking about, he knew exactly where Pil Gyu had seen it from. Chapter 3 When Chan Ryong was still very young, his father had the fame of being one of the best hunters. His name was Yu Song from the first generation of elite warriors. To the common people who hadn't experienced the horror personally, the first generation warriors were legends that would forever go down in history, but those times could be called a real hell for hunters. For one thing, there was a lack of information about what dungeons were and what monsters were there. Monsters, which now seem not very dangerous, were for them compared to an unknown disaster. No skills, no normal equipment, no knowledge, and in such a nightmarish environment, the first hunters gave their lives, acting by trial and error, and those who managed to survive, gained experience and achievements for the next generations of defenders. And of course, they became heroes. Dragon Slayer, this was the nickname given to Yu Song, the only man who could defeat a dragon and he was the best hunter in Asia. His father was the man the boy respected and envied the most, and he firmly believed he was invincible. But the cause of Yu Song's illness turned out to be poison, poisoned during a dungeon sweep. As always, Chan's father tried to overcome the difficulty, but over the years, the man's physical condition has reached its limit. Colleagues, for whose sake Yu Song risked his life, 
took advantage of his illness and appropriated his accomplishments and possessions. After some time of physical and mental suffering, the world began to forget the name of the dragon slayer and the image of a hero could no longer be seen in him he had lost everything he had and remained only a forgotten patient. The customer couldn't believe that Pil Gyu had lost to some green puppy, but Chan explained that everything became clear when the bully started bragging about how he had beaten his colleague. There are only two reasons for good hunters to retire either they're physically unable to continue their careers due to injuries, or they died in a raid, and then the young man added that if the big guy was being paid above minimum wage, it was better to fire him. Huang grabbed the bald man by the shoulders and reminded him of the job, but now the pay would be twice as much. To his indignation, the broker objected that they were the first to start bullying, then the interviewer softened and happily agreed to the terms. When everyone left, Jay told that this time Chan will have to fight with a heavenly wasp and the guy was very surprised, because it is too strong opponent. A monster that is known as the most dangerous not only in the Korean peninsula but in the whole world. The old Yoido area where the nest of sky wasps is located is considered the area with the highest level of difficulty. It's difficult for a rancher to deal with even one wasp, and there's a whole army of them, so there's no chance for a smuggler, but Huang told his buddy that, according to the customer's words, there was a major raid yesterday involving white, ranked hunters, which was not covered by the media. The state supported the military and a squad of seven white hunters was set up. So to speak, all the Korean stars were gathered, although it is worth a couple to come, as it is immediately written about it in the newspapers. Their goal was to destroy wasps, but it didn't work out, but they managed to hunt the queen wasp, and one managed to get the royal jelly, the substance used to feed the new mate. Chang Ren was surprised that a hunter of white rank decided to become a smuggler because of some nutrient. But Huang told of one man who had escaped death and come back to life by eating some royal jelly. Chapter 4 The official stance of the Hunters Association and the government was that all the nooks and crannies leading to the dungeons should be carefully guarded, but in reality, of course, that wasn't the case smugglers could always find a loophole. Jae Hwan opened the passage and wished his buddy to take care of himself, but Chan was clearly worried about something. The broker realized that he couldn't get the words about the miracle jelly out of his head. The young man realized that rumors of the life-giving properties of the substance were likely exaggerated, but if there was something that could heal his father, he would never lose the thread of hope. The young man said that one of the smuggler's men had delivered the goods to the rendezvous point, but there his tracks break off and it's unlikely he kept the goods for himself, he was likely injured or in a mess, and Chan's job is to survey the scene and retrieve the goods if they're there. As the conversation about the life-giving properties of jelly continued, Huang advised his men to keep his head down and focus on the job at hand. After the fusion, many different dungeons appeared all over the earth. The biggest ones in Korea were Jeju Island and part of the Yoido neighborhood in Seoul. The first area is where Jejudo Island merged with the Hot Rock. The second area was a huge dungeon centered around Yoyido itself and several surrounding areas, Maipo, Yongsan, and Yangdingdenpo and many glorious hunters had parted with their lives trying to clear it, but to no avail. Securing the rope, Chan began to climb down. He realized that the royal jelly was a very valuable item that more than just humans would hunt for. The delicious aroma that permeated the entire forest would surely attract a bunch of monsters. To confirm the speculation, Ryung saw a huge paw print on the ground. Jean Sae Ram, a freshman at the High School of Heroes, was in the worst situation of her life because she thought that her second semester exams would be no big deal and the assignment was quite simple collect as many coins as possible hidden in every corner of the dungeon, which, by the way, was not of the highest level. The monsters in it were weak, so it seemed to her that everything would end quickly, but suddenly it appeared, the monster nicknamed Titanium Ape was at least 10 meters in height, and four arms and ugly face that looked like a skull covered with skin, instilled genuine horror. Although the chances of success were slim, the girl decided to fight, but the arrows she used to wound the monster did not hurt it. It doesn't even need to dodge or block attacks, as its hide is stronger than the armored vehicle's defense, but she had a trump card up her sleeve. Jean Say Rom's class is Archer Mage and she can apply magic to the tips of her arrows. Right now, she decided to choose Fire Bombardment, a suitable attack for such a strong monster, as long as you hit the target accurately. When the fire had dissipated a bit, 
Chin saw the monkey sitting in a tree. Trying to resist only made the monster more angry, so it jumped down and chased after the archer. But suddenly, the monster fell. Chang Ryong landed gracefully on the ground, holding a metal battle pole, seemingly solving the problem with the titan monkey. Chapter 5 Chan examined the fallen monster and concluded that the blow had struck its chin, but it was not enough the ape began to rise to its feet. The young man grabbed some kind of pistol-like instrument from his holster and ran to meet the monster. When he got close enough, he shouted to the girl to bury her eyes and activated the device. A bright flash of light was accompanied by a loud sound, a stun torch. The item was made from the scales of a deep-sea fish, and it's amazing, what can't be said for the price, disarming function had once won the love of many hunters. However, unskillful use has caused many to lose their eyesight, so making and possessing a torch is considered illegal. Ryong often compared smugglers to cockroaches if you climb everywhere, you'll get swatted one day, so he tried not to help or fight the hunters, and his main tactic he used this time too was to flee. Chin was surprised that the young man who was ahead suddenly disappeared somewhere. But the fugitive himself interrupted her thoughts and jumped on the pursuer from a tree and pressed her to the ground, asking her why she was running after him. The girl said she just wanted to thank her mentor, but Chan didn't believe her. Then she said she knew who the guy was, so she wanted to hire him for money. Ryung didn't want to listen and then Jean S.E. told her about the 50 million won reward for denouncing the smuggler, and the 450 million won reward for the prisoner. Even if she caught five of them, it wouldn't be enough money for this thing and showed and kills blood medallion, but the archer promised that it was just an advance payment and if the young man helped pass the exam, he would get even more. Suddenly, they heard a stomping sound and turned around to see a monkey coming at them at a great speed, glaring with bloodshot eyes. A huge shock wave threw the boys into the air. In flight, Chang threw his pole to the new acquaintance in order to repeat the trick with the explosion, only instead of arrows to use his weapon. Chin Sae was in a panic she had only a quarter of magic left, with such a reserve such a huge monster cannot hurt. The boy asked to solve this problem quickly he couldn't last long with his bare hands. The girl threw him a charged pole and decided to run away while the monster was distracted. Chan was disappointed, but he knew something, the thing they always tell the students of the high school of heroes in battle, strength is not as important as the right timing and the feeling to hit the target accurately. In other words, the senses and abilities inherent in every professional hunter. In confirmation of these words, the young man struck exactly at the junction of the titan monkey's head and neck. The blow was so powerful that the monster was left with a fiery mark from the pole. Chapter 6 Since she was a child, Jean Sae Ram could get anything she wanted. The president of South Korea's largest company, the Chin Sun Group, married a member of the elf race, and as a result of this marriage, they had a half-elf daughter. Chin was eager to become a hunter, but the elves' excessive demands and arrogance prevented her from realizing her dream. The instructor did not see potential in her, as she was not a pure-blooded representative of the magical race. The calculation was only for average performance, which for a human would be a real praise. The teacher did not see any ability in her and advised her to abandon the idea, because skills do not fall from the sky, and it was impossible to buy them with money or influence. Chang Ren was horrified to find that his glasses had shattered in the collision with the monster. Huang had warned that such an item couldn't be bought in a store there were five kinds of spells cast on them, including facial recognition interference and voice alteration. Jean Sae watched her savior's nonchalance in amazement and couldn't believe that her peer could do such a thing. Coming to her senses, the girl asked if he was a student at their hero high school. The young man called the assumption nonsense and demanded the promised payment. Chin held out the locket to him. She then said that the tuition fees for institutions that train future hunters were high, so she would be happy to help, but Chin objected that he did not attend such places. The elfus lost her temper she could not believe that a self-taught student could master such techniques, master the sense of time and speed. Then he threw Donggang High School's student ID card in her face. This calmed Jean down, but the guy demanded her ticket in return. After studying the document, he put it in his pocket, and responded to her indignation by saying that she should get everything she was promised before she changed her mind. Chan then pulled out his phone and took selfies with his new acquaintance. He did it for assurance, because accomplice smugglers get the same punishment, 
and the photo would serve as excellent proof. At that moment, Jean S. Ayuram realized that she was dealing with someone more dangerous than she had imagined, but it was too late. Chapter 7 Chang Ryong opened the calculator and began to calculate. The girl asked why he was doing it now, to which the young man replied that he needed to figure out how much his services would cost and asked for a more specific explanation of what needed to be done. Chin said that there were coins hidden throughout the dungeon that needed to be collected. She had already found one, one more to go, and the test would be completed, but to complete it, she needed to find a cube with the image of these coins, touching it would confirm her identity, and now it was necessary to go to the ruined shopping center Eugene. Ryung realized that the girl met the monster for a reason, apparently, he was attracted by the smell of royal jelly, which should just be in the building. Chin was dumbfounded she knew that royal jelly was produced by only one creature, heavenly wasps. The guy reminded her that she was going to go there in person, so seeing her scared face, he asked if there were any other places where the coins could be hidden and SAE Ram replied with horror that there were places, but there were no more coins left. After thinking it over, Chan said he would just get her the coin and quietly leave, that's how he works, and then inquired about the price of the matter. 950 million won was all the money the elf had at her disposal right now and added that if more was needed, it would have to wait a little longer, but the young man said that would be enough for now. They ran, but Jean Sae could hardly keep up with her savior. When the moment was right, she asked him if he had never studied anywhere. He replied that he had almost no one, but the next second he ordered her to stop there were two creepy monsters ahead. It was true that Chang Ren had not attended any special training schools, he had acquired all his skills through experience, fighting with his bare hands, but he had watched his father's techniques as a child and had learned three basic techniques. The first technique is the needle, which mobilizes strength, speed, body weight and directs it all to the opponent's weak point and although it seems easy, it is actually very difficult to execute. Chang pierced the necks of the monsters one by one as if the pole had really turned into a huge needle, and this is how few hunters even of higher ranks can do it, even those who have mastered the technique on their own, but Chang Ryong had mastered it perfectly. Jean Sae was surprised, because normally these monsters would gather in packs of five, but there were only two. So they too had suffered losses because of the royal jelly. The ruined center was already a few dozen meters away, so the young man suggested a break soon different creatures would gather here. His companion asked again if he had had individual lessons as a child, but he explained that he had simply peeked at the training a few times. He caught the girl's angry look, it pissed her off that he had learned so many things just by watching. Chin then tossed her partner a vial of stamina, but instead of drinking the contents, the guy hid the item in his pocket. The elf asked why he didn't use it and Chang replied that he'd rather sell it later, because the black market would give more than a million won for such a thing. The guy seemed very strange to her and the feeling was mutual. Chang announced that since she had drunk the potion, there was nothing to sit around doing nothing. Approaching the building, the young man clarified the situation they had not come to hunt, but to take what they wanted without a fuss. Although she had learned a lot from the school, but he is a master of survival, so one must trust and carry out whatever will be said, but Jean Se Ram couldn't understand where she got this feeling from. She had spent half a year at the hero school, during which she had failed to gain acceptance and get acclimated there, and now she was going into the danger zone with someone for the first time. Once inside, the guys found a terrible picture the whole room was covered in blood, and there were body parts of different monsters lying on the floor. Even Chan, with his experience in cleaning up dungeons, had never seen anything like this before. Chapter 8 these were all the monsters that were in this dungeon, and they were dangerous enough even for professional hunters and if even they were torn apart, what was inside? Chan turned to the girl, he realized that his companion knew that something dangerous was lurking in the mall, but was surprised because what she saw exceeded her expectations. From the next room came out of the ugly monster named Chopping Rib on the stomach was a huge mouth with sharp fangs, and instead of a head on the neck was one eye. Suddenly, the monster threw out its long tongue and grasped the pole. The monster then tried to pull its tongue back with a sharp movement, thus pulling Chan back. When the young man was upside down in the air, he let go of his weapon and hung from the ceiling, catching on to the supports. Next, he jumped, striking a rib right in the eye. The monster fell down, letting out a horrible scream. Chin Se was frightened she thought the monster was dead, 
but it had turned out to be so resilient. Chang explained that it wasn't a matter of survivability, someone had left it there on purpose to be a warning to those entering. The girl asked who would do such a thing. Suddenly, a voice came from the second floor saying that it was him and raising their heads, the partners noticed some young man. He went on to say that he was tired of waiting for them, so he left a rib to see when someone would come. Chan turned to the elven woman, asking if she knew the young man, but she replied in the negative. The next moment the young man was already standing in front of the boys. He said that he regretted that they would die in such a place and it became obvious that this was not just a hunter, but a villain who wanted to kill Chan to get his hands on the royal jelly. The bandit didn't deny it he happened to know that his colleague had taken something valuable out of the dungeon and he wanted to attack Chan on the way back, but things didn't go according to plan, but then the bandit found this building and there was definitely something valuable to hide here. Chan Ren realized that the communicator wasn't missing because of his injury and now he would have to kill the man. But he didn't even need to fight the enemy to realize that he was facing a real hunter of the highest ranks, much different from the rabble he had met before. The smuggler ordered Jean Sei to find the coin as quickly as possible and leave while he distracted the enemy. The Elphus was scared for her new friend, but he said her presence wouldn't change anything and shouted to run away. Meanwhile, the bandit had already prepared for battle and launched a katana attack, but Chan blocked the blow with his pole. Another series of clashes failed to result in success. At the right moment, Chan knocked the sword out of his opponent's hands and pinned him to the floor. The fighter was surprised he admitted that he had underestimated the guy because of his age. It would take some sweat to destroy the girl as well, but it shouldn't take long. A figure dressed in a black suit appeared in front of Chan, a golden-ranked hunter, Yang Duke Young, who had decided to use the equipment. Chapter 9 Huang made himself a cup of noodles. He was still looking at the big man Pil Gyu, who was still unconscious. Jay had said that he had lost not because he was stupid, but because he deserved to lose, but then concluded that Gyu was a little dumb after all. Hunters aren't trained to fight each other, the bulky man might have been able to handle the monster, but there was no surprise in losing to the smuggler. The customer wondered if hunters outright never fight among themselves. Huang explained that it certainly happens, and the higher their rank, the further it goes. After all, anything could happen in a dungeon, so a simple display of greed could be written off as a sudden attack by a strong monster. Considering that no alibi was needed, many higher-ranked hunters practiced in anticipation of a battle with a comrade. But this tank's level wasn't strong enough and if he was caught beating up a colleague, it happened outside the dungeon, probably a simple skirmish over equipment. The customer interjected, but Huang replied that there was nothing strange about that assumption, the equipment that hunters use to fight monsters. If this guy had it, he could still wrestle. The man asked if this very equipment was so important. Jay replied that it certainly was. Chang Ren was also aware of the fact that the equipment greatly increased the hunter's chances, but he couldn't understand why his opponent was able to stay on his feet when he had hit the target. Apparently, his defense was too strong. With one hand, Yang Du grabbed the pole, and with a kick, he sent Chan flying several meters away. The opponent laughed and said to show everything the kid could do. But it was impossible, because Yang's shadow jacket, at the expense of the user's blood, provided support for physical strength, and also formed a cover to protect him from blows. These were the basics of the berserker style that Du used. It couldn't be that he didn't have any weaknesses, however, if Chan was inept at responding to his opponent's attacks, he would perish. Gathering his strength, the young man ran at his enemy, but a sword strike to his stomach made him stop. Then he took off his jacket and complained that it was his favorite. The wound was not deep, so with a smile on his face, the guy stood up and turned to Yang Du, said that the hunter only relies on the equipment, so he was a little confused, but it is forgivable, after all, he is a schoolboy who came without anything. If he had such armor, the situation would have been different. Chang Ren knew that his enemy was in a hurry, because in addition to killing the young man himself, he also had to catch up with an important witness like Jean Sae Ram. He's stalling for time, and Yang Du Kyung is in an increasing hurry. The second technique he learned from watching his father was rippling. Chan was aware of his opponent's strength and knew that his strength would not be enough to pull off such a powerful strike alone, but now that his life was in danger, one had to act decisively. The guy swung the pole and a powerful blast of energy rushed out. 
Yang Du Kyung's defense was broken through, however, he continued to advance even though he was damaged and the smuggler didn't think he would meet a professional hunter who would act so recklessly. The guy advised his opponent to surrender as there was no point in continuing the fight. However, Yang Du wasn't going to comply, he stuck a dagger into his stomach and said that no matter how this ended, he would definitely destroy Chang Ryong. Chapter 10 Meanwhile, Jin Se Ram was already on the fifth floor of the mall. The identification cube had confirmed her identity and the test had been passed. However, the disturbing thoughts and words that Chang Ren had said to her did not leave her head. The girl believed that he wouldn't have gotten into a fight without having an escape plan, but she couldn't just leave like that. From an early age, Yang Du Kyung was a genius everything came easy to him, and he knew it. Even adults recognized his abilities, and his peers bowed down to him. However, there was one thing that he could not achieve was to enter the high school of heroes, because there are rumors that you can get there only through connections they pay attention only to money, ignoring the really talented students. When he did get into the school and completed his studies, he passed the final exams with the best result. At the award ceremony, the teacher said that the guy would definitely become a first-class hunter. Ian had no doubt about it, he would soon be looking down on this old man. However, on his first task, he realized that the teacher's words were not praise, but consolation, and he was just like the others, maybe a little better. Yang Du Kyung tells Chan that his jacket is made from the skin of a bloodsucker monster. The hunter is allowed to absorb the blood flowing to his heart, a rather low fee for the ability. The enemy soared through the air and pounced on the young man. With difficulty, but Chan fought back. The bandit praised Ren for his excellent reaction speed and asked why he had decided to become a smuggler. The boy countered that it didn't matter. Either way, Chan thanked his opponent for the opportunity to stomp someone like him. Chan thought about how to defeat such a strong opponent, since he wouldn't be able to throw punches forever. Then an idea came to his mind make the hunter waste blood, if he really uses it, he'll reach his limit sooner or later, and then the guy will use that needle. Yang Du had already gotten the hang of it and was about to strike again, but suddenly the monster's head exploded. When the fire subsided, the young man saw that the enemy's defense had suffered even more damage, with Jean Se standing behind him. He was impressed that she had returned. Rising from the ground, Yang tried to crush his opponent in a leap, but he landed on the ground with a thud from the twisting blow of the pole. Chapter 11 Chin Se looked at the defeated hunter with interest and asked her friend if he was going to die, but Chang reassured her that men like him usually lived a long time, in any case, he would no longer be a nuisance, or he would say goodbye to his career. Then he informed his companion that she had returned the favor. At the girl's question, he recalled how he had saved her life twice, and though she had helped him once, he could consider the matter closed. He smiled as the elfus boiled over with irritation. Smelling a sweet odor, the two went down to the basement of the building and found a dead communications officer with a briefcase ajar. Unlocking the case, they saw a flask with a lozenge-shaped object that emitted a sweet odor. The odor was very acrid and so wonderful that it could make one forget one's thoughts. Recovering, Chan slammed the lid shut and said he had to leave before more monsters came. Returning to the first floor, the friends didn't find Jan on the floor, but he soon showed up himself, shouting that he had memorized their faces and would surely get his revenge. Going out through the main exit, the hunter saw right in front of him a giant titan monkey, which already aimed at the victim. Chan suggested that his companion use the alternate exit. When they reached one of the hills, Chan began to say goodbye and thank the girl for her help and rejoiced that they had succeeded in achieving their goals. As they left, he reminded her of the bank transfer and confidentiality. But suddenly Chin called out to him, asking what he thought about meeting again and the boy looked at the elf with surprise. Jae Hwan greeted his ward with joy. Inspecting the royal jelly, he praised Chan for his quality work, but noticed his drooping state. He asked if it was because of the hunter who had died in battle with him, but the smuggler countered that that hunter had not died because of him, so there was no blame on him. The young man asked if he could take the two sacks that were in the same case. Huang reminded him of the rule anything not related to the order could be kept, so as long as it wasn't royal jelly, Chan could do what he wanted. Jay wondered what kind of kid would eat that jelly, and Chan was surprised to hear about the kid. Huang then revealed that while the jelly can be used to bring back life, it has more valuable properties. 
It can expand the abilities of whoever eats it, but it's best to do so when the child is young, and it's definitely not to be wasted on the hopeless, the child must be at least a student of the school of heroes. Stepping out of the subway, Chan remembered the words Jean S. E. had said. The girl had said that they would meet again soon, because every year the hero school held an entrance exam for all comers, and the boy had a good chance of passing the exams, even though it accepted a maximum of two applicants. Chin suggested that he join her at the hero high school. Chapter 12 A hunter can't mop up dungeons alone. No matter what talents he possesses, it is almost impossible to cope with the constant waves of monsters alone. That's why you need a team, where everyone fulfills their role according to their skills, thus they make up for each other's shortcomings and overcome obstacles. This is what dungeon mopping is all about. Chin continued to explain that every year in the school of heroes create factions. Chan didn't understand he thought it was when you pick a side and fight the other, but the elf is countered that they wouldn't do such childish nonsense there. There are two factions in her school, led by students who are in the top three. Now Chan understood why Jean Sae was taking the test alone the teams were recruited from members of the factions, and she was not a member of more than one. The young man asked if the teachers didn't say anything, but the elfus said nothing at all. She explained that finding a team depended on the students' abilities. Ren tried to say something, but remained silent, and the girl understood what he wanted to say she doesn't have enough abilities, she knows that she is unlikely to be an excellent student, but she doesn't study so badly that she can't get into a team. However, teams are also made by students who are not in any of the factions. As she said earlier, they are run by two of the best students and the leader of the first one dislikes her, though she doesn't show it outwardly, he just weaves intrigues and does everything to keep Chin away from the teams. She's hanging in there now, but she won't be able to stand on her own in her senior year. That's why she wants to hire Chan if he's only there for her, then maybe SAE Rom can handle the whole ordeal. They approached the dungeon barrier. The guy went his own way, saying goodbye to his companion. Though she was sure he wouldn't call, there was some strange feeling inside. When Chang had gone far enough away, the elf girl was called out by some man with a scar on his face and a prosthetic instead of his right arm, it was teacher Kong jong -guk, a close combat instructor. She was surprised to see the teacher, as the exam time had not yet come. The man explained that there was a problem some monsters were in areas they shouldn't have been in, the place where Jean Sae picked up the last coin was one of those areas. That was the reason why the instructor was here, asking if everything had gone well. The elfus lied that everything had gone fine, and she hadn't seen anything out of the ordinary. Khan accepted the answer understandingly. And then with the same nonchalance he ordered his apprentice to stand behind him behind her back stood another titan monkey, only a little bigger. The man was surprised, for normally, these creatures wouldn't come in here. Jean Se realized that she was attracted by the smell of royal jelly, but she didn't dare to report it to the teacher. All the teachers of the hero school were hunters in the past, and most of them had graduated from this school, but due to their injuries, they could no longer sweep the dungeons and retired, at least that was what the others thought. Kong Jiangguk toppled the giant ape to the ground with a powerful jumping kick. Its head was charred and smoking from his ability. As a result of the attack, the instructor's iron arm melted. Tyranny Fighter, this was his nickname when he was not even 30 yet, being a ranker and he didn't care about other people's opinion because he was a hero himself and trained the future ones. Soon both of them reached the training camp of the School of Heroes, where two students, apparently a mage and a tank, were discussing what would happen to those who signaled for help. The one sitting on the ground said they would probably be retaken. The tank said that such weaklings didn't belong here, and when he saw Jean say, he said that one of them was coming. Jongguk told everyone to wait and when the others returned, to double-check that everyone was in place and change into their school uniforms. The beautiful white-haired elven girl surrounded by other students, seeing Jean Se unharmed, pretended to be pleased. But the archer didn't believe the girl's sincerity, to which the latter objected that these words were even hurtful. Chapter 13 Six years ago, when Jean Sae was only eleven years old, she was learning the art of magic with an instructor who was also her uncle, Zeke Esserm. Each lesson was given to the girl with great difficulty each time creating a fireball was accompanied by a hellish pain in her hand. But in parallel with her was a white-haired elf girl named Anisha. Her teachers marveled at her abilities. Every spell was easy for her, 
and although she was also a half-blood, Zeke believed her abilities were greater than some of the purebloods of their race. It was understood that the cousins would be compared, but Zeke warned them to be careful if they backed down, Anisha might crush their opponent. At the training camp, the white-haired elf pretended to be surprised that no one wanted her cousin to join the team, because she was capable enough to do so. Chin offered her to join her team, but Anisha refused, citing the need for two fighters of the same class in the same position. The white-haired girl calmed her opponent by saying that she would be retaking the exam soon, but Sae Ram asked with a smile why she needed to retake the exam, since she had already passed it. Anisha pretended to be happy for her cousin and praised her for her efforts. However, as she left, she advised her not to overdo it, she would inherit her father's company anyway. This made Jean Sae very angry. Chang Ren ran into the room at the university hospital. The doctor asked if he was a relative, to which the young man shouted and asked what had happened. The doctor started from afar this patient has a very rare case, one could even say, the only one in the world, and so far no one has survived dragon poisoning. The disease is still incurable, but painkillers can be used to suppress the symptoms. The only problem is the composition of these painkillers, that the milk that the very dangerous monsters feed their cubs is the only antidote. Chan said that if it's about money, it's not a problem, but the doctor countered that it's not about money. In the past the milk of the celestial tiger could be obtained in large quantities, as it was not used anywhere, but now the situation had changed, because there was a potion on the market that increased the strength of the one who took it, and the main ingredient of the preparation was the much desired milk. Chan wondered if it was impossible to get a single dose for a dying patient. The doctor explained that from one dose needed for the young man's father, ten ampoules of the potion could be made, so the businessmen would never part with even a drop of the substance. The doctor promised to try to do something, but without connections there was nothing to count on. Going outside, the guy was distraught, and although he didn't really want to, his hands dialed Jean Say Rom's number by themselves. The girl was at the gym working out, but when she saw the caller, she abandoned the exercise and grabbed the phone. Ren said that he agreed to the offer to join the hero school. The elven girl realized he had some sort of condition. Chan told her about the situation, to which Sae replied that there was no problem her father's company also made the potion, and the dose her friend was asking for wasn't that big. The young man exhaled as if he had dropped a huge stone from his shoulders. The Elphus then asked if he had time on Sunday to study for his exams and Chan agreed that it wouldn't hurt to prepare. The friends met outside the Chinson Group Defense Research Institute. Chan asked what they would be doing here, to which the girl replied that they would be measuring abilities here. After the fusion, many people's abilities increased, something that before the incident, the average person's characteristics corresponded to rank D, not counting magic. By the time they got to C, they were considered a genius. An A B skill was considered superhuman. A hunter could only become a hunter if five of his characteristics were C ranked. And the hero school accepts heroes with three Bs. Chang Ren thought it was a simple physical exam, but the Elphus countered that it was a child's procedure, and as a teenager it was a bit more complicated. The boy asked how much more complicated, but he saw for himself, finding himself in the arena, dressed in a special suit. In front of him stood a large robot. Since he was here, he would fight properly, in fact, he had long been curious about what it could do. Chapter 14 Chang took up a fighting stance, preparing for battle. Chin Sei and the former hunter who was now working at the research center, Chung Yeo Min, were watching him on the cameras. The latter noted the young man's determination, as many people are lost when they first see a golem. The Elphus laughed awkwardly. Yeo Ming announced that it was time to begin and activated the robot. A normal performance measurement is usually taken at 6 or 7 years old, but for detailed measurements, special devices are worn that stimulate the body, pushing it to the limit in various areas. The more unique the abilities and training level of the test subject, the more difficult it is to get the results, because it is hard to stimulate them to the limit. Yeo Min called out to her buddy, asking her to answer one question. She recalled a story about a guy failing to get into a specialized school, so she asked how could he fail with such abilities. Chang stood in the middle of the room, and his mechanical opponent lay at the other end, fuming. Chang concluded that, even given the reduced difficulty level, the young man's professional training was immediately apparent. 
First, he dodged a few times. And then waited for the right moment to strike. And it was striking that he was better than any professional in terms of senses. Chin Se asked about the measurements, but she didn't get a clear answer the test subject's limit hadn't been raised yet. Increasing the difficulty would not bring results, so the alpha suggested removing the safe mode and running the robot at full power. Chan warned her friend that it was against the law to remove the safe mode for a person who was not a professional hunter. They both wondered how to test the abilities, but a voice from behind them interrupted them. Chin's uncle, Zeke Esserm, entered the room. He accused the employee of using the lab for his own purposes, for which she would be punished. The elf stood up for her, explaining that she had asked Yeo Min herself, but to no avail. The director of the development department, which was Zeke, objected that as long as the company belonged to her father, the girl had no right to give orders. The rumors about the new boss turned out to be true. Although he was an uncle to Jean Se, he had treated the girl very coldly since childhood. After all, she had done nothing wrong now today was a day off, and besides, the other hunters were also using the room for their own purposes. Their conversation was interrupted by Chan asking about the problems that had arisen. The elf asked her niece who the young man was. Yeo Min navigated faster than the girl, explaining that he was a friend of Jean Se's. He wants to enter the school of heroes, but he failed the exams last year, so his measurement results were lost. Since a new test is very expensive, they decided to help the guy. Seeing the golem lying on the ground, Zeke Esserm said that he would personally take the measurements, because the results cannot be obtained while the robot is in safe mode. He would now go down and fight the young man himself. This happens very rarely, but when it becomes very difficult to measure abilities, a competition between hunters can be organized. Naturally, in such a case, the opponent must have skills several times higher than the one measuring the performance. Chan Ren didn't know who his opponent was, but he sensed the danger. He was much stronger than that jerk in the mall. The young man knew his strength, but felt that he was unlikely to be able to overpower such a strong opponent. Zeke Esserm was the director of the development department of Chin Sun Group, and he was also a white, ranked hunter who was ranked 7th in South Korea's rankings, and a warrior's color depended on his position in the ranking table and white was assigned from 1st to 10th place. Taking off his jacket, the elf rolled up his sleeves, stood in a fighting stance, and then ordered to attack and not to worry about his safety. Chapter 15 Chan Ren's technique was simple he threw a strike that he only had to dodge. The hiccup time was used for a striking attack and perhaps it would have worked in a fight with opponents of a slightly higher level, but the elf simply caught the pole. Then with a kick of his foot he sent the young man flying. Zeke wondered did the guy really think such a move would work, or did he just like to receive? Either way, Chan looked pathetic to him. He got to his feet rather quickly, and the elf picked up the pole and threw it to his master, pointing out such a stupid mistake as a lost weapon. Ren felt some resentment from the hunter, but didn't understand what it was about. He rushed forward again. Zeke thought about repeating the previous attack and decided that two times would be enough for the lesson to be learned. But he was impressed by the speed of the young man's movements as he got closer and began to spin the pole. Jin Se and Yeo Ming, who were watching the fight, were also amazed at how the schoolboy was practically fighting the white hunter on equal footing. It's a wonder he couldn't get in somewhere. And although Zeke's controlling strength, Min noticed one major flaw in Chan. Meanwhile, the elf had already seized the initiative and once again landed several blows on his opponent's body, causing him to fall to the ground. Zeke did not even comment on the young man's defeat it was predetermined from the beginning. Only the process that led to this defeat looked pathetic. Yeo Ming shared her observations with Jean Se her friend lacked basic knowledge. His abilities and senses are excellent but basic skills like attack and defense are lame, it's obvious that there was no initial training. The girl herself was disappointed, with his abilities he could have been much stronger with basic training. As he left, the elf stated that he had seen many guys like Chan, with unique abilities, who didn't put an ounce of effort into developing them. Unexpectedly, the lad rose to his feet, accusing the master of excessive barbs against him. The elf was impressed by the young man's persistence, for he thought he had struck the decisive blow with which he was going to end the fight. Chan suggested that the elf fight again, so that he could show what he was capable of. Chapter 16 The girls in the observation room didn't understand why Chang Ren suddenly decided to continue fighting. 
The urge to go all the way to the end was good, but they had already gotten all the information they needed, there was no need to fight anymore. Chin Sei also tried to dissuade him from continuing the battle, but to no avail. The elf also tried to explain to the young man that it was over the results wouldn't change no matter how much they fought. Zeke then suggested that Chan wanted to gain his recognition, to hear his opponent praise his willpower. But the boy countered that he was just a little angry at the end of the fight, because he hadn't managed to land a single blow. In fact, he had another reason, he had achieved everything on his own without training and basic preparation. By trial and error and fighting monsters in the dungeons. Chan looked with pity at all those people who thought they were hunters, but ran away when they met a really strong monster, or killed their comrades because of equipment. But this elf was different. This was the first time he had met someone other than his father that he could call a true professional warrior. This time Zeke was determined to correct his mistake and stomp his opponent so fast that he didn't even have time to be angry. Chan was ready for another round. Chin Sei noticed that he had taken up a stance she hadn't seen before. It was his father's stance at first glance it seemed clumsy to the, white, hunter, definitely not for pole fighting. However, when Ren began to move, it felt like there was another person in the arena instead of him. Although his movements were clumsy, they were all quick and without a hitch. The elf dodged attacks with ease, but was staggered as he was unable to launch a counter-attack. In an instant, both jumped upwards. The master decided to take a moment while landing, and knocked the young man to the ground. Lying on the ground, Chan laughed although he had lost the battle, it wasn't bad for a self-taught student. The elf told him that he could have won if he'd kept it up, but went back to those stupid pole holds, then asked if he wanted to boost his self-esteem by doing so. The young man replied that no, that he had simply reached his limit all the moves he knew ended there. Zeke Esserm had a bad reputation among hunters because of his nasty temper, but no one dared say anything against it because of his superior skills. A white-ranked Voni, of which there are only ten in the country, and the best healer. Chin Sei ran out into the arena, calling out to her uncle, and he leaned over Chan's body and ordered her to be quiet. Then stood up and said that he had healed the young man, so there would be no trace of the fight. From the boy's face, indeed, the bruises and abrasions disappeared. As he left, the elf asked him his name again. The niece said Yu Chang Ren. Zeke smiled he didn't expect to meet the son of the once great Yu Song. Chapter 17 Zeke Esserm stepped out into the parking lot. A pumped-up young man with glasses called out to him from his convertible, jokingly accusing the elf of not giving notice of his delay, now they were sure to be late for the briefing, and everyone already thought it was the man's fault every time. The development director said that one important matter had taken longer than expected. A young man in the car asked if it was about a fight with some kid. But at the same second he froze in surprise, noticing the small scratch on the elf's snow-white face. It was very strange, but Zeke explained that the kid was going to enroll in the school of heroes. The man concluded that if he was just about to enroll, then the guy didn't even have a passport yet. Something told him that the kid had a good chance, even though in the three years of driver's training at the hero school, no one had ever passed the entrance exams. The elf had said that, although Chan's level was lower than his own, he could match the performance of Kong Gong Ho, the name of the man driving the convertible and the leader of Korea's first NX sweep squad. He chuckled that there was definitely no such thing. Zeke then turned his attention to the new car and asked if Gong Ho had bought himself a new car again, but the man countered that he was no longer splurging like he used to and this was a car he had wanted for a long time and then the elf inquired about the cost, but Kong said it was inexpensive, only three billion won. Chang Ren woke up in some room on a gurney. Examining his hands, he was surprised that the scratches were gone, and the pain seemed to follow. Chin Sei came into the room with two mugs of tea and was glad to see his friend awake, but then asked what he was thinking, did he really hope to beat her uncle? Chan interjected about the uncle. The elfus explained that he was indeed her mother's brother. Now the young man understood why Zeke was bullying him some guy had shown up who probably just wanted to take advantage of a naive girl, the elf was just worried about his niece. Chin argued that it couldn't be because Uncle Zeke had always been very strict, but their conversation was interrupted by Yeo Min walking in. She inquired about the fighter's health, Chang replied that he felt fine. The employee boasted that her boss was the world's best healer. The boy choked up at what he heard the elf was so good at fighting, and that wasn't even his specialty. 
Yeo Ming said that the measurement results were also excellent and gave him a clipboard. Jean Sae was happy when she saw the results, but when she heard that her friend wasn't happy, she got angry. She called him an idiot and told him to shut up. The prerequisite for becoming a hunter is B rank and above. But there must be a balance even if dexterity is high, but it doesn't match health, it's useless. If only muscles are developed, they will not be able to pull the other abilities. Those who have three C ranks at once are one in 10,000. Those with three B ranks are one in 500,000 they can even fight alone or become a top-ranked hunter. Chang Ren had two A rank and one B rank, spitting on the balance was just crazy ability. Yeo Ming told him that even Zeke didn't have a single A ability out of those three. She explained that the stats reflect innate potential, not current skills. Even if you have all the top-level abilities but don't progress and improve, there would be no difference from D. Other factors are also very important for example, whether the specialty you are mastering suits you. Then, hinting at Jean Sei, Min added that there are some hunters who fill in the gaps in their abilities with endless training. Chang Ren was grateful for the explanation, but said that he didn't understand anything about it. It's just that he has an acquaintance whose level he still lacks a lot. The girls inquired who it was, since hunters with such power were rare, and assumed he was a very famous person. The young man embarrassedly confirmed their guess. He and Jean Se had already said goodbye, arranging to meet up next weekend. But Yeo Min stopped her friend and asked if she wanted to stop by the production department, as she hadn't been to the center for a long time. She said that she didn't have any special friends there, and her uncle wouldn't let her go. However, with a smile on her face, the ex-hunter said that Zeke had already given her permission, ordering her to take Chan to the production department when he woke up, and to tell the manager that he was his guest. Chin Se was very surprised and asked when he had said that. When the elf was leaving, he gave this order and said that he should find the guy a suitable weapon, no matter how much it cost. Chapter 18 Every hunter's dream is to have highly effective weapons and armor. Even if they have outstanding abilities, quality equipment provides high support to the wearer. Therefore, as a hunter's level increases, suitable armor is needed to maintain that level. Chang Ren still didn't understand why he needed to buy equipment items, didn't the school give out everything he needed. Jean Se slapped her forehead and explained that this would be the case if it were a regular school, they issued equipment according to the standards so that there would be no discrimination between students. Yeo Ming continued that it's different at the hero school, where the ability level is taken into account, so each student has to choose their own equipment. Chan suggested that in that case, those who were born into wealthy families were in the most favorable position. The girl didn't deny it, but explained that there was another way to get good equipment. Most high school hero students will become better hunters or ranchers in the future, so there will be those who want to invest in those abilities. If a teenager manages to pass the entrance exams, he starts to receive different offers from businesses and just rich people. And after graduation, such students pay part of their fees or sign a contract, becoming an advertising face. For example, Yeo Min herself received a scholarship from the Chinsun Group and even after retirement, she is guaranteed a research position. In short, going to a hero school is a very lucrative thing. However, you have to get in there first. The degree of difficulty of the transfer tests is much higher than the simple entrance exams. Everyone is doing their best to prepare the equipment, and Zeke Esserm himself ordered to give it to Chan. He has already arranged everything, all he has to do is go down to the workshop. Yeo Min then said she had to run, wishing the young man good luck, she sincerely hoped he would enroll. The two friends walked to the elevator and Jean Sae explained that it didn't matter how much money you spent on a weapon, what mattered was who made it. Chin Sun Group is one of the best manufacturers, known all over the world. Although, in principle, for that price, everything everywhere else would be of about the same quality. They descended into a huge forge, which, incidentally, was a dungeon not long ago, and was called Boiling Abyss. Suddenly there was a rumble of footsteps behind them, and soon Chan saw a huge monster, but for some reason clothed, and with a mechanical arm. The one-eyed monster complained that Zeke had dared to wake him up over the weekend. The young man prepared to fight, but the elf stopped him, explaining that he was the head of the production department named Arjesh Thunderhammer. Once upon a time, he had even obtained citizenship of the Republic of Korea in a simplified manner. Arjesh laughed at the word, manager, to people, he is always a disgusting monster as well. 
Then he looked at the guests and asked who the elf had warned him about the boy or his niece. SAE Ram replied that they were supposed to send a video with the indicators, but Hammer objected that he didn't know about any video, and, in fact, all this was being handled by the employees who had the day off. The girl was upset, but the supervisor said it wasn't a big deal if Zeke said to help in person, then he could check on the guy himself. Then turned directly to Chan, asking if the main weapon in the pouch behind his back and the young man answered in the affirmative. Then Arjesh stood up and said, try to catch him. Chin asked confusedly what that meant, to which Hammer replied that in their tribe it was a normal procedure. All the more reason he wasn't going to work up a sweat for someone whose abilities he didn't even know about. Then looked the smuggler in the eye and noticed the look in his eyes, he was definitely familiar with hunting. SAE Ram tried to stop her friend, but Chan said it was long past time to remember he wouldn't refuse such offers. He unsheathed his weapon and ran forward, but Thunderhammer didn't even move, so the boy easily put the pole to his throat. Arjesh's face was astonished and he asked excitedly where Chan had gotten the pole. Chapter 19 Chan Ren didn't expect this after all, he had made a precise strike with the needle technique. Of course, there were many monsters that he couldn't take down with a single blow, but just now, he had literally felt a wall in front of him. He couldn't say anything about endurance, but it felt as if Arjesh wasn't a living being. What kind of monster was it? Jean Sae was also worried about this fool who actually went into the fight, but she was confused for a different reason. The danger level of monsters was determined by stars. One star meant that the creature could kill a human, but could be handled by a normal adult male with a weapon in hand. A two-star could be defeated by trained soldiers armed with firearms. A three-star monster will require an armored platoon. And when a four-star monster appears, the city is evacuated, after which fighters and artillery come into action. This is the maximum for which the forces of a modern army. In the case of five stars and above, modern military forces are practically useless and even if you can win, the losses will be unthinkable. Therefore, to fight monsters with a danger level above five stars, elite units of hunters are brought in. Arjesh had a danger level of seven stars, and he was already getting angry, ordering them to answer the question, because he had made this poll himself. The boys' mouths dropped open in surprise. Chin Se assumed that if this weapon was made by Thunderbolt himself, then its rank must be at least A+. Owners are strictly monitored, so the data should be in the association's database. A smuggler would definitely not be able to obtain it honestly. Chang Ren objected with a smile that it was none of his business, despite Jin Se's pleas to tell the truth. The monster got angry and tried to punch the young man. At this moment, he felt only one thing, death. There is no way to dodge this attack, there is no way to use that needle, as the enemy has no weaknesses, and there is not enough time for the quicksilver. The third option is the last technique he learned from his father. In any collision, the one who is bigger and stronger wins, but what if it is not head-on? You have to calculate the angle and position even if you can't win, you can at least dodge. Taking advantage of the hiccup, he wanted to pierce the monster's eye, but it grabbed him with its mechanical arm and lifted him up. That's when Chin Se Ram stepped in, reminding Arjesh that those who had been granted citizenship through a simplified procedure were not allowed to harm people if there was nothing life-threatening. Breaking this rule would cause him to lose all his rights, reverting back to being a monster. Although the young man looks suspicious, you can't kill him without figuring it out. Hammer calmed the girl down, saying that he didn't intend to maim the young man, that he realized where the staff came from, and then gently lowered the young man to the ground. Arjesh turned to the boy, apologizing to him and informing him that Chan had a special right to wield that pole and furthermore, he would give him a reward. The elfus interjected what he was talking about. Arjesh asked her if she knew how the monster was suddenly working for humans. Chin Se spoke of it being raided by elite hunters at some point. Arjesh laughed at the silly story people tell each other. Thunderhammer then told his version of events and as it turned out he was the only person who could defeat him. The hunter had not only chopped off its arm, he could have cut off the monster's life as well, but he didn't. Arjesh looked at Changrin and said that he was talking about his father. Chapter 20 Among the entire tribe of giants, only Arjesh has reached the highest level. His lifespan is almost infinite and such individuals are extremely rare there are no more than ten senior titans known to exist on earth. 
Even in physical terms they are almost impossible to surpass, but the main ability they possess is blacksmithing. The innate talent of this tribe is to create artifacts with special properties. Only the oldest titans and dwarves can boast of such skills. But unlike the latter, the titans do not consider humans worthy of communication. Thirty years ago, an attempt was made to capture Arjesh and the 9th Special Hunter Squad was sent on a mission, a first-class organization that could boast of its achievements in clearing dungeons. However, they had no idea what hell awaited them in the dungeon. The ninth team had lost most of their members, although they hadn't even reached the giant itself yet. The hunters were confronted by huge mechanical defenders with a danger level of at least four stars. But when Arjesh himself appeared, the captain of the squad realized that now there was definitely no chance for them to survive. In the next moment, the charred remains of the commander were on the ground, and the last member of the team was standing in front of the giant, barely able to stand. The monster praised him for his loyalty and moral duty, but laughed at the quality of his equipment. He did not understand why these creatures, humans, considered themselves masters of the world. Suddenly, a tall and trim man with a halberd came out from behind the defender who had already prepared to die. Seeing his bare torso, the hunter asked who he was and the guest replied that he was sent by the association when the signal for help was intercepted and accused the team of invading the dungeon without a plan or information. The man was Yu Song, who was only 32 years old at the time. He was not widely known at the time, as he spent more time saving others rather than creating a media image. The mechanical guardian tried to hit the man, but only parted his hand, and then with a powerful jump kick, the robot was incapacitated. With a look of surprise on his face, Arjesh looked at the gifted hunter. From that moment on, it all started, and after the fight with the elder titan, Yusong was the talk of the world. Chapter 21 Yusong turned to the frightened member of Team 9, asking if he had any mana left. The bewildered young man replied that he had a little bit, but it was enough for a simple buff. The hunter countered that he wasn't interested in buffs, he needed to know if the mage could lift objects into the air. Two of them were still alive. So you ordered them to get outside immediately, dragging their friends out. The conversation was interrupted by the giant's laughter he was amused that the hunter was making it sound like people had a choice. Sun countered that of course they did, that without his permission Arjesh would not touch a hair on their heads. At that point, Ten years had passed since the merger. The released power and increased physical stats had allowed them to reach the level of superhumans, as well as mastering the technique of making equipment from materials mined from the dungeons. This helped them develop their skills quickly. However, weapons were not used very skillfully. The solution was human technology, a completely new combat system that went beyond the usual limits. Back then, only a few hunters thought it was necessary, researched it, and practiced it. One of those was Yusong. Arjesh tried to strike with his giant flaming sword, but the man managed to fight back. Taking advantage of the delay, Song struck the monster's chest with his halberd, causing it to crouch on the ground. He praised his opponent for his outstanding technique, it was the best he had ever seen. The giant said that the fight might even have ended differently if Yu's weapon had been as good as his skill. However, the man was an unknown hunter at the time, so he couldn't afford to acquire the highest ranked equipment. From the previous attack, the axe handle had cracked. But to the one-eyed monster's surprise, Yu Song managed to repel the next blow. This was the technique that his son would look up to in the future, ripples. The man takes on the power and strength of the opponent's attack to use it to lunge back. Sun's physical strength and experience was on a completely different level compared to other hunters. Only a true hero could fight like this. After Chang Ren's father used this technique on Arjesh and cut off his arm, the monster inside him died and the life belonged to the victor. Although Song could have taken it back, he didn't do so. The raid that failed the ninth special unit was considered a victory. The whole world shook as they learned how a group of hunters had defeated a monster with seven danger stars. Arjesh sought asylum and soon received citizenship and a registration card. Although there were no fatalities during the sweep, only seriously injured, he still had to serve his sentence by working at the forge. He personally made Yu Song's pull despite the fact that he hadn't even asked for it. Jean Sae Ram was shocked she had never thought that the news of the special team capturing the most dangerous monster would turn out to be a lie. Thunder Hammer explained that this pull was just a hilt. He wanted to forge a powerful halberd, 
but Yu Song never brought the materials for the blade. Soon communication with him had broken off, and he couldn't visit his new friend himself, so he had only sent a portion. Now Chan understood why his father had been reluctant to give the weapon to the creditors. The Elphus looked at the young man in surprise upon hearing these words. Arjesh asked the lad to give him the pole to finish the job. Now he would make the weapon not for Yu Sung, but for his son. Chapter 22 Looking at his former creation, Arjesh concluded that he did not know how long the work would take, but he would try to complete it as quickly as possible. However, he shouldn't rush the blacksmith the masterpiece should reach perfection on its own. On the way out of the elevator, Jean Sae awkwardly asked her friend how he was feeling. Chan said it was bearable, despite the grip of a huge metal hand. The Elphus then inquired if the young man was free on Wednesday. If so, he could study for a written exam and take a practice test at the same time and the lad agreed. Sae Ram said that his father seemed to be an outstanding hunter, she had never thought that that raid had been accomplished thanks to one man. The girl gently asked what was wrong with him now and reminded him that Yu Song was undergoing heavy treatment. Changren's face drooped slightly as he heard this and said he had to go, asking for a ride he wanted to walk and think about life. On the way, the elven woman read an article about that very case, reclining in the luxurious leather seats of her limousine. If Arjesh was telling the truth, then those five legendary hunters of the special unit had taken credit for Yu Song's actions, and the giant had no reason to lie. Considering that what happened in the dungeons remained the same, there could have been dozens of similar cases. Because most of the achievements were written into history under pressure and threats, Yu Song had become known as a false dragon slayer. But Jin Se assumed that everything must have come out when he got injured and went to the hospital. To prove her point, she came across an article that questioned the words of the five hunters and called Yu Song the real hero. Suddenly, she received a message on her phone with a report card for her sophomore midterm exams. In the teacher's room of the hero's high school, a girl named Zhou Se Ah apologized to Kong Jong Guk that he can't even have a normal weekend because of her. The man calmed her down by saying that he couldn't refuse to help her and that he was going to check the grades of the freshmen. Cho was pleased that everything had gone well both the students' exams and her first days as a classroom teacher were much better than when she was a student. When she saw the results, she asked if the teacher knew that this particular student would be the first place winner. Jiangguk said that such a result was hard to predict. Opening the tab, Jean Sae couldn't believe her eyes, there were currently three students in the first year who were considered geniuses, unexpectedly, all three were of mixed blood. The first one, Choi Daya, has impeccable swordsmanship skills inherited from his father, a white, ranked hunter, as well as magical powers inherited from his elf mother. The second, Anisha Esserm, has a level of skills that even a pure blood elf would envy, and in the future she will probably become one of the best warriors. And the third one is a healthy Tyr Belkison, a child, who was the result of the union of a human and a dwarf. He had inherited strength and stamina from the latter and flexibility and agility from humans, and was now a rising star with the best physique not only in the hero school, but also in the world, and a student who had won first place in the exam. Cho Sae Ah said that she didn't doubt the young man's abilities by any means, but usually, the first places were taken by the leaders. Even considering that the difficulty wasn't the highest, he passed the test alone. Jiangguk explained that soloing has its advantages, and physical strength isn't Tyr's only strength. The girl admitted that she was a little worried because the guy doesn't socialize with his peers at all. This does not only affect the guys from the same course, others are also afraid of Tyr Belkison. In the second year it will be difficult without a comrade with whom to share thoughts and feelings. The man advised not to worry so much. Of course, caring for your charges is a great quality for a classroom teacher, but sometimes all it takes is believing in them. Besides, students are usually not what they appear to be on the outside. On Wednesday, two teenagers were walking through the high school grounds with hot coffee in their hands. Suddenly, they bumped into a big guy named Tyr, pouring the contents of their plastic cups onto his snow-white t-shirt. They had already prepared for a beating, begging him to forgive them, but surprisingly the big guy apologized himself, complaining about his absent-mindedness. Throwing the coffee on the ground, the boys ran away. No one knew what was in the boy's heart, and in the meantime he missed his mother terribly. Sukyu Bin is a Korean hunter working in Europe with a great reputation. 
She often told her young son about her homeland, so from childhood, Tyr developed a liking for Korea. The atmosphere in which he grew up and his outstanding personal qualities allowed him to enter Hero High School on special grounds. Speaking of problems, he was a very unsociable young man. The peculiarity of an introvert is that even though he had a perfect command of a foreign language, he still found it difficult to talk to a native speaker. He was afraid that his peers would laugh at his accent. It was past his first semester, and he had developed an image of a majestic lone wolf. Tyr's only hobby was walking alone. So today he decided to go for a walk, registering for the computer club at the same time. However, there were problems in a huge queue, whose members were quietly resenting, afraid to anger the big guy. He saw the unrest and once again decided that he was only disturbing everyone and was about to go home, but suddenly he was called. Turning around, he saw a young man who told him that there was no way to register here, it was a device charging station. With a smile on his face, Chang Ren offered to guide him to the right place. Chapter 23 Tyr Belkison sat at the computer while Chan prompted him not to fill in all the fields, only the one with the asterisk, and then hit, done. The young man awkwardly thanked the assistant, to which he wished him a pleasant game. The young man realized that in front of him was a foreigner who spoke Korean quite well. Chan then opened a correspondence with SAE Ram, who informed him that she would be late. If he had known this was going to be the case, he wouldn't have gotten up at nine in the morning, but his plans for today included a morning workout with the Elphus and then a trip to the black market. Although Huang had allowed him to take the strange black octahedrons that were in bags next to the royal jelly, selling items related to heavenly wasps now was tantamount to suicide. However, it was possible to get a round sum of money for the Askill Blood Medallion that was obtained as a reward for helping with the exam. One of the three scourges that had struck the Inger jungle was a huge serpent named Askill. For the past few decades, many different special forces had tried to destroy the monster, but all attempts were unsuccessful. All that was recovered were a few broken scales and some blood. That's why this medallion is so valuable. Suddenly his thoughts were interrupted by the excited voice of the big man Tyr, who asked if he could sit down next to him, because there were no other seats left. Chan did not object, explaining that no one would come to him anyway. Chan saw that the new acquaintance was playing Heroes of Chaos and surprisingly they were about the same level, so Chan offered to play together. Belkison agreed, considering he always played alone at home. In the center of Seoul, there are some ruined places called Scars. During the merger, almost the entire capital was destroyed, but most of it has been rebuilt, except for the areas close to the dungeons. The space between the wall guarding the dungeons and the city softens the blow considerably evacuations are only declared when monsters get over it, but there hasn't been a single attempt to breach it in the last twenty years. The gates of the wall opened, and a vehicle for transporting small to medium-sized monsters drove into the city. The driver grumbled that his so-called co-workers were making millions working as hunters and he was getting pennies for driving. His partner asked him to stop whining he himself knows he won't get more than the association. The man countered that he wasn't whining, just a little resentful. Suddenly a noise was heard from the trailer. The girl assumed the monster was awake and told the driver to stop the car so she could check it out. When she got out, the man notified the association of the stop. The passenger seat door opened again, but instead of her partner, there was some other girl whose face was covered in bruises and abrasions. With a smile on her face, she ordered the driver to move off if he wanted to live. Tyr Belkison was appetizingly gorging himself on the noodles the guys had ordered from the gaming club. He was very surprised that they were the same age, as the young man was very tall with pumped up muscles. Ren asked him what school he went to. Suddenly their conversation was interrupted by a rumble outside. Eyewitnesses to the accident had recorded video of the wrecked monster truck, and some speculated that the driver had gotten behind the wheel drunk, but they couldn't figure out how he'd ended up here in a busy urban area. From above, the same girl was watching the gathered crowd. On the phone she said that the job was done and the interlocutor ordered to get out immediately, because the hunters would soon arrive, but the criminal objected that she could not be caught, but the sullen silence in the phone made her obey. A clawed black hand ripped open the roof of the trailer, and several monsters of the horned horror species crawled out. The number of horns on their heads depended on the level of danger. Laughing, the perpetrator staked hundreds to death before rescuers arrived. In panic, people rushed away, 
but the agile monsters left them no chance and several people had already been mauled. One of the horned ones set its sights on another victim. In a deft leap over the heads of the unfortunates, Chang Ren struck the monster. Chapter 24 The horned terror landed on the ground with force, flying a few meters above it. The young man ordered the people frozen with fear to run away. Then looked at the startled monster he had seen these before, with one horn, they weren't very dangerous. Suddenly a motorcycle flew toward him, which Chan dodged at the last moment. He didn't expect this he was attacked by a large monster with two horns on its head. The lifespan of these monsters is relatively short only five or six years. Most die with a single horn, but a small fraction, about 8%, can grow a second horn. In this case, not only the lifespan and the ability to reproduce is increased, but also the physical strength, which is several times higher than that of normal individuals. Sure, it was agile, but not so much that Chan couldn't catch it. The only problem was stamina. Although with stamina he was superior to many, but without equipment and weapons, even just weapons, his chances of success were much lower. The monster tried to strike, but the young man was able to dodge, ending up behind him and a hole appeared in the wall that took the blow. Right under his feet, Chan saw a road sign. Picking it up off the ground, he broke off the warning itself, intending to use the leg as a pole. Suddenly, the horned terror turned his attention to a few children nearby. Ren couldn't understand why they didn't run away with all of them. The difference between two and three stars of danger is great. The physical strength itself is simply devastating, a three-star monster can easily tear a grown man to pieces. To fight such a monster with bare hands is suicide. The only exception would probably be a top-ranked tank. Tyr Belkson grabbed the horned horror by its arms and threw it far forward. However, even his strength might not be enough for a fatal blow. In a high jump, Chan Ren launched a needle attack and pierced the monster's neck from behind. The tank was very surprised at what it saw. However, it was still a few minutes before the rescue team arrived. Although Tyr himself had received the distress signal, more people might die before then. This young man had long dreamed of becoming a hunter and so he was prepared to distract the monsters before the hunters arrived, and to do so, he decided to use a provocative cry, a basic tank technique that attracts monsters nearby. However, Tyr couldn't afford to suggest some unfamiliar young man risk his life together. Chan knew about this skill too, so he told his buddy to use it. Tyr said he was going to do it, but then it would be very dangerous, so the lad had better hide, but Chan countered that he was going to fight anyway, even if he was alone. He himself hadn't noticed how he'd started acting like a hunter, but he decided it wasn't such a bad thing. Turning to face the monsters, Ren added that Tyr was good at fighting and playing, and he hadn't had a chance to test his abilities before. Chapter 25 Gathering his strength, Tyr let out a deafening call. And in the next second, no less than six horned horrors stood before him. The boys didn't even realize that so many monsters had broken out, yet they were ready for battle. One of the two horned ones ordered the four regular ones to attack the tank. Meanwhile, along the rooftops of the buildings, Chang Ren got close to where the two horned horrors were standing. Suddenly, he turned his attention to a truck. Several of the one horns were collecting corpses and loading them inside, that was why there were no dead people on the streets, but it was unclear why they were doing it. Right now, however, all he had in his mind was the plan Tyr had come up with. Both realized that without equipment it would be difficult to win and by ordinary fighting they would only hinder each other, so the young man suggested to distribute the tasks he, as a tank, takes on those who are weaker but superior in numbers, and the agile comrade fights with a couple of stronger monsters. Chan jumped down. Several attacks failed to bring the desired result, the horror was still on its feet. A needle would definitely help if he had his father's pole, but he couldn't fight at full strength with this aluminum road sign. Then he decided to use the technique that Zeke Esserm had used against him, and although it wouldn't work exactly the same way, he understood the rough pattern. Basically, with the exception of a few, the elf's attacks were not that fast. As always, Chang Ren decided to use the conditions where any mistake could cost a life for personal growth. He tried to replicate the moves he had learned from Zeke, unleashing blow after blow at his opponents. One terror had already been brought to the ground. After his father, the elf was the only creature Chan could learn anything from in terms of martial arts. 
But suddenly there was a hitch, which the second two-horned man took advantage of to knock the lad to the ground. Chan fell to the pavement with force. Leaning on a makeshift pole, he got down on one knee, chuckling at how pathetic he now looked. The monster was already swinging to finish off his wounded opponent, but he was suddenly knocked back a few meters by a powerful blow from Tyr. Chapter 26 From the balcony, two guys were watching the duel with interest Zhou Dongyun, the overweight leader of the Dungeon Explorer Circle, and his friend, Kim Chang Hyun, a member of the Circle. Dong Yun was overjoyed that he was able to record what was happening on his phone. The other guy asked who the two were who had defeated at least a dozen horned horrors with their bare hands. The leader of the circle suggested that they were either high school heroes or unknown to no one but very talented newcomers. He then asked his friend to edit the video and post it on the internet, it would surely garner at least 10 million views. Tyr Belkison couldn't believe that the two of them had tackled such dangerous monsters together he thought that Chang Ren was just trying to stall until the rescue team arrived. The young man interrupted his musings by asking him to help him up. The young man asked if he was alright, and his friend said that he was not quite alright a little sore here and there, but compared to his expectations, he was quite well. Tyr praised his comrade for how splendidly he had fought, defeating as many as two horrors. Chan countered that his new friend had defeated nine of them himself and Belkison stammered, saying that his enemies were only second rank. The big man then asked what school the kid was attending. It seemed that the rumors didn't match reality, as the hero's high school considered the other students much weaker. Chan was surprised by what he heard, and immediately asked where Tyr was and if there was anyone stronger than him. The big guy was embarrassed, explaining that he didn't socialize much with his classmates, and he had certainly tried his hand at exams, but he thought that grades and ability were two different things. He then added that he is probably somewhere in the middle of the rankings. Chang Ren was worried that the bar was too high, so he might not be able to pass the entrance exam. Then the young man drew his friend's attention to the one-horned horror that was standing on the roof of the truck. He didn't seem to be affected by the provocative cry. Chan, however, assumed that if there was anything special, it was inside the trailer. Suddenly the hand of some monster grabbed the one-horned man and dragged him inside. Both were surprised at first, but Chan quickly realized what was wrong. Horned horrors were tribal-type monsters. The two horned ones were considered the leaders and heads of small families of ten individuals each. When several families joined together, its members became stronger and multiplied faster, but there were limitations. In the harsh world of the dungeons, horrors were a lower middle class, as their numbers were regulated by stronger predators. But at one point, the situation changed, thanks to the appearance of the three-horned monster, which overturned the established order. He became not just the leader of the tribe, but the king of an entire large army. His estimated threat level was five stars and now he had gotten out of the truck, and was heading for the two unarmed teenagers. Chan tried to block the monster's attack, but the defense was breached and the youth flew backwards. The tank tried to grab the king of horrors, but was lifted up and sealed to the ground. Chang Ren tried to get up, spitting out blood, but every movement was given with great difficulty and accompanied by pain. They simply didn't have enough time. Two youngsters with outstanding abilities would definitely reach the highest level someday, but that moment would not come today. Determination, courage, perseverance, tenacity, feelings, even if they used all of their qualities, it still couldn't make up the difference with the absolute performance of a five-star monster. Currently, there was no one who knew what kind of person Yu Song was before he lost his identity. But more importantly, there was currently no one who could accurately say what he had left behind. Chang Ren struggled to get up, calling out to the monster that was about to finish off his new friend. The King of Horrors attacked the young man with a powerful energy charge. Suddenly, he took on the entire flow. When the residual effect dissipated, Chang Ren stood in front of the monster with a violet glow emanating from him and his body somewhat transformed with increased muscle mass. Chapter 27 Twelve hours before Chang Ren and Tyr Belkison's decisive battle with the King of Terror, Jean Sae Ram was in a real state of confusion. The truth she had learned last Sunday was in no way getting out of her head. Two days of recording the events of the past tormented the girl. If Chang Ryong's father had indeed been wrongfully convicted, she could understand why he had lost his power, and there were probably more than a few who would take his place. But one thing she still couldn't understand was the testimonies, 
which may have been falsified, just shockingly, but there are many contradictions in the media. Despite all the testimonies, Yu Sung's image wasn't that bad. If she were him, she would have fought to the end. But not only did he not do anything, but he admitted all the accusations against him. After the press conference, the media situation stabilized, and Yu Sung remained in people's minds as an ordinary fraudster. But here was the look on his face, it felt like he had been forced to confess. Jean continued to study the file, but suddenly she came across the facts of his biography, in the marital status column it was stated that Yu Song had no wife or children. She thought for a second that Jang Ren was not her sibling, but then everyone would know that, and they looked a lot alike. Sae Ram assumed that the hunter's confession must have something to do with his son. Chang Ren still couldn't understand what was happening to his body, but one thing was certain it kept moving, and that was enough. In the next moment, he landed a powerful blow on the approaching monster. The monster received a wound that bled. What followed was a deluge of attacks that forced the King of Horrors to flee away. The three-horned monster was climbing up the windows of the high-rise, but Chan was not a step behind. The energy strike couldn't hurt the pursuer, he just dodged it. Ren used the technique of Zibing, with which he sealed the opponent into the wall of the house opposite. After the previous attacks, the monster had clearly become weaker. Needle could have ended the fight, but suddenly all the power was gone somewhere. The King of Horrors noticed the weakness and was about to pounce on his opponent, but suddenly he was almost hit by a truck flying into the air. Tyr Belkison stood below and the monster lunged towards him. Having positions among the hunters is essential in order to assign roles that suit everyone individually. A tank's duty is to stand his ground, even if he is badly wounded. In addition, sacrifice helps to gather all forces together and make a decisive blow to the enemy, but this is already the task of a close combat specialist. Using his hand as a weapon, Chang Ren pierced the distracted horror king with a needle. The fight was over. Even though the guys were already exhausted, they had to get out and Tyr picked up his friend and helped him out to the platform where the professional hunters had already arrived. Both boys laughed at their punctuality. The capture of a vehicle that was carrying a captured monster, resulting in the deaths of dozens of civilians, not an hour later, this shocking news spread everywhere and together with this two young heroes had a huge impact on the world. Chapter 28 Little Chang Ren cried out in pain as his father treated his wound. He asked him to leave it as it was, it would heal on its own, but Yu Song argued that even the smallest wound had to be treated, otherwise it might hurt more later. The boy asked if his father was ever in pain, such as when he was bleeding on missions. The man explained to his son that it hurts every time he gets a wound, and if he starts bleeding, he gets scared, but he tolerates it, otherwise other people might get hurt. As a child, Chang Ren had the same thought in his head that when he grew up, he would become like his dad. However, without knowing the exact reason, he believed that his father would not have wanted such a future for him. Every time he said, you can't, Yu Song felt regret. The boy believed that someday his father would tell him why he said that, however, it was impossible right now. Suddenly, he woke up lying on the hospital bed the situation seemed familiar to him this had already happened a few days ago. Suddenly he saw someone sitting next to him looking closely, he recognized Zeke Esram. The young man immediately tried to get up, but a sharp pain in his back stopped him. The elf explained that the treatment had been successful, but recovery from such wounds usually took a long time, and the arm, which was now in a cast, he would be able to move in about a month. Right now, it was better to think about resting, as there was still a lot of work to be done. Chang Ren thanked the elf, of course, but immediately wanted to ask a question. Zeke interrupted him, guessing what the young man would ask, the elf told him that he and his father had worked together before. Suddenly Chan grabbed an apple from the plate with a sharp movement, which the guest had peeled for himself. Seeing Zeke's tense look, the lad asked what was wrong, wondering if the elf had expected him to try to hit him. Chan then ordered the hunter to get out before he stabbed him with the knife he had in his hand. Suddenly the young man smiled, wondering if this was the reaction his interlocutor had expected. Zeke admitted that he had indeed expected something similar, but only a little more emotional. Ren said that if the elf had come two years earlier, he would have gotten what he wanted in full. His head was filled with thoughts of those who had done this to his father, and those who had seen it all but didn't intervene, and his heart felt only one thing a thirst for revenge. Zeke asked if his thoughts had changed now. 
Chan said no, but he had reprioritized that dealing with the white rank hunters was not something he was able to do at the moment. His main goal now is to earn money to pay for his father's treatment, and then just live until a cure is invented. Although he doesn't know when he will be able to achieve them, he will definitely do so even if someone gets in his way. Zeke said that he has no plans to interfere with the young boy, but he does want to ask a couple questions why he's not in the paperwork if he's Yusung's own son, and who raised him when his father started having a mental breakdown. The boy replies that he grew up alone. The elf accepted the answer and then asked if the guy knew about Daganahai and Chan said he knew of no such person. Zeke explained that it wasn't a person, but the official name of the dragon whose venom infected Yusong, and the most dangerous creature ever to live on earth. Until a few years ago, all of humanity was gripped by fear of dragons. Since their appearance, humans, together with the other races of this world, have been building a wall to protect themselves from these ferocious monsters. Thanks to the hunters, dungeons, and the monsters that inhabit them were no longer a threat to human survival. Except for the dragons, which were strong enough to overcome this barrier. They are the strongest, most intelligent and cunning creatures that have ever lived. Although ancient races with hostile attitudes were extremely rare, dragons did not simply dislike humans, but considered them an object to be exploited. But they made the unforgivable mistake of underestimating the enemy, believing that humans would never be trained to fight monsters. The dragons decided to wait until states collapsed and society declined, then they could breed humans like cattle in exchange for safety, and be honored as deities. But hunters appeared, who learned how to mop up the dungeons. When they intervened personally, wiping entire cities off the face of the earth, Yusong came. A hunter who proved that even such powerful creatures could be defeated by being well prepared. Thanks to him, change began to happen and people began to successfully hunt dragons all over the world. Chan said that after that the dragons hid deep in the dungeons, but the elf objected they just changed tactics. They are very cunning monsters who can also take the form of other creatures, so it is very difficult to catch them. Zeke then stood up from his seat and approached the young man, saying that the information he was about to reveal was secret, but Yusong's son and future hunter had the right to know. Daganahai is the leader of all dragons, for a long time, the greatest hunter has been chasing him, but without success. However, if you kill him, you will be able to make a cure for his father. The elf looked the guy straight in the eyes, saying that if Changren was willing to do it, he should go to the top, and then Zeke would give him a chance to punish Daganahai. Chapter 29 Before leaving, Zeke had advised the young man to pretend that he hadn't heard the words or had forgotten about them if he didn't have the resolve. Looking at the card the elf had given him, Chan smiled, he would not back down, even if it meant death. Zeke had also advised him to remember to first do his best to prepare for the encounter with these insidious creatures, for dragons lurk, deeply hidden behind many faces, waiting for their time. Even if they manage to obtain and publicize the evidence, there will be no point until they succeed in destroying these creatures once and for all. Once uncovered, they will only hide again, and there will be panic and distrust in the community. So they must be dealt with quickly and secretly, with one sharp blow to the weak spot. Zeke has been assembling a posse to capture Daganahai for years. Everyone he has chosen are outstanding hunters who can slay a dragon. However, if Chan doesn't level up enough to fight shoulder to shoulder with them, there will be no place for him on the team. And when one part of the plan falls out, all parts of it can be affected. Chan wondered if they couldn't wait for him alone. Zeke explained that the specialists had not yet been able to learn Daganahai's identity, so the young man had about two years to prepare. The elf then cautioned that when everything was ready, Chan's circumstances would not be taken into account, so he should think carefully before agreeing. Zeke didn't care what anyone thought of him, if the young man didn't believe him, they might never meet again, but whether or not Chan accepted the offer, the elf could promise one thing for sure. Whether he joins them or not, Zeke will surely destroy Daganahai. At first, Chan had his doubts. He couldn't believe that there was finally a chance to cure his father. But at this moment he felt not fear, not confusion or even anxiety, but joy and he couldn't afford to miss the opportunity he had dreamed of his whole conscious life and he would definitely be a part of this team, no matter what it cost him. A lovely woman of short stature entered the room, asking how Chan was feeling. He said he was fine overall, but his muscles were sore. The woman smiled, explaining that it wasn't surprising given the damage that had been done, 
the arm had to be put back together piece by piece. Chan looked at the plastered limb and asked again. The woman said that when he had been brought to the hospital, the arm had been in a very serious condition, it would have been amputated. But a high-ranking elf healer had been involved in the operation and had reassembled the upper limb. Chan then awkwardly asked about the young man who had been brought in with him. The woman said he was discharged the same day that Guy's recovery rates were astounding. Suddenly, the nurse asked for a photo with the patient. The young man did not object, but asked if he could be discharged. The woman said he could, but it was better not to go through the main entrance it was full of reporters eager to interview him. Chan didn't understand why they wanted to interview him. Then the medic explained that after the battle with the King of Horrors, the whole world knows about the two young heroes. If not for them, there could have been several hundred casualties. Then she remembered the package that the patient's friend had left behind, it would help them get out of the hospital undetected. Chan got excited, thinking that inside the package was an item with invisibility magic, after all, rich people have many opportunities to get their hands on unique items, but all he found inside was a climbing rope. When Chan climbed outside through the window, the nurse asked if he could post a photo on social media when the guy became a famous hunter. He didn't object and waved her off. Then he saw a Rolls Royce parked at the curb, and realized that Jean Say had come here to pick him up. The boy sat down in the back seat with her and wondered if there was nothing better for an escape. The Elphus handed him a bag of new things and a smartphone, assuming he needed it. Chan's face looked like he was about to cry but she ordered him not to even dare. She had so many questions, but she didn't know where to start. Chin asked why the monster was exactly where it was at that moment, but he said he didn't know. Then inquired as to where they were going. The Elphus explained that her friend was very lucky the best atelier in Korea had decided to create a hunter costume for him. Chapter 30 There are three types of hunting suits, the first are made of simple fabrics, which have the lowest level of protection, but because of the nature of the material, they are the easiest to give magical properties to. Most often such suits are used by healers and mages. The second type is metal and they undoubtedly protect the wearer perfectly, but not everyone can cope with their weight and will have to sacrifice dexterity. These are most often worn by tanks. And the last type is leather, which is somewhere in the middle of protection and mobility, so it is suitable for a fighter at long distances, such as Changren. The young man had seen firsthand how bad it was to fight with bare hands, so he didn't argue with his friend. She kept trying to find out how the two of them had managed to deal with the King of Terror. Chan replied that someone had made a video and she could watch it herself. But the girl replied that the video was only up to the middle and the battle with the five-star monster was not in the video. Chan couldn't believe what he heard even if he and Tyr Belkison had prepared for the battle, they still wouldn't have been able to defeat the five-star monster. He couldn't understand where such strength came from. The young man didn't know what to say and simply replied that it had somehow worked itself out. Jean Say was once again surprised at the strength of the guy who had once again proved his brilliance. However, the girl was worried about him, so she advised him to be careful and Chan said that he had seen the reporters, but the elf girl countered that it wasn't just about the media attention. The second guy had already been revealed, but he wouldn't give his comrade's name. Chan was surprised when the fight was over, he asked her not to give away who was with him, as he didn't want others to know his name and face. The big man promised he would. Noticing the smile on her interlocutor's face, Chin assumed that he and her classmate had become very good friends. Either way, she said, no incident should be allowed to happen before the exam. Chan wondered why exactly before the exam. Sighing, the elf explained that she had done a little research about the exam it was much harder than expected the odds were 100 to 1, and that was if anyone got in. Chan tried to reassure his friend, because the admission is usually frightened by imaginary numbers, especially since his abilities are much higher than the others, after all, the elf was somehow taken. These words infuriated the girl, Chan tried to justify himself, but she backed off rather quickly, explaining that he hadn't said anything new. She cautioned, however, that not everyone could pass the exam on their own. In the past five years, most of those who have entered high school are the offspring of hunters. Naturally, their parents know each other, so they can agree in advance on which team their child will take the exam. The number of those who entered in this way, especially in the last five years, is 100%. Their school does not have such a provision, 
but the Elphus advised Chan to try to transfer on special grounds, for merit in the destruction of monsters. The self-assured young man said he didn't need it. Most is not all and if someone before him was able to, he would enter the school on his own. When they entered the building, Jean Sae said she would go first and her friend could change in the restroom for now. The Elphus walked up to the front desk, telling the employee that she had an appointment with the president of the company. Suddenly, the landline phone rang and the receptionist picked up the phone, and after the conversation, she informed Chin Se that the president had some urgent business to attend to, so he wouldn't be able to accommodate them today, but would compensate them. The girl freaked out, saying that it's not about compensation, the exam is two months away, and the president is just cancelling the meeting without informing her personally. Some girl was watching the conflict from behind cover and the guest's face seemed familiar to her, but she couldn't remember the name. Lately the hunters often said that the youth had changed. The warriors who came to replace them always found themselves in better conditions than their predecessors. Not only were the equipment and technology more advanced, but they also had tactics for attacking monsters, which the first wave of hunters had learned through personal combat experience. However, by the phrase, current youth, they meant those who were already born into wealthy families. The pioneer hunters formed marriage unions, giving their children everything they had themselves. This applied not only to skills, but also to upbringing. Jean Sei turned her attention to the girl who had called out to her, Han Jie Yun, the student council president of Hero High School. Jie Yun gave a feigned apology for her uncle cancelling the meeting, she needed his help urgently. Since she was the cause of this inconvenience, she has a great idea on how to make things work out Jean Sei just gave up her seat, and Jie Yun is very grateful to her for it. It was utter nonsense, but the Elphus understood what it meant to be the president of the student council, and she was also well aware of Han's bad temper. Confused, she couldn't utter a single word. Suddenly, Chang Ren called out Chang Ren from behind and told Jean Sei that it couldn't be helped if the student council president urgently needed an uncle. Han Jie Yun was about to thank him, but he suddenly turned to her, telling her to cut the crap and get off his friend's back. Chapter 31 Chan's boldness impressed the insolent maiden. She asked who he was. Jean Sei tried to explain, but a sudden cutting pain engulfed her body. Han Jie Yun ordered the elven girl to keep her mouth shut until she was asked. The young man told her all the facts about himself, down to where he lived, his height, and his favorite food, but at the end, he emphasized that he was preparing to transfer to the Hero High School. The guy added that he was disappointed that in one of the best schools in the world for hunters, some damsel was hazing, just like in the army. Jie Yun was offended by this. Suddenly, Chan felt the same pain as his girlfriend a moment earlier. The student council president said she didn't particularly dislike people who threw loud words only if they had the right to do so. Suddenly, a man ran out into the lobby of the center, it was the president of the company, Han Sung Wu. He scolded his niece for barging into his office so unceremoniously and answering the phone. The man reminded her that it hadn't even been a week since the incident happened and apologized to the guests whose meeting had been disrupted. Chin Se rushed to reassure the company president. Chang Ren beckoned his friend over and asked what exactly Han Jie Yun was doing at their school. The Elphus explained that the student council president is a position that only the strongest student in the school can obtain. Each student receives a temporary license that allows them to gain experience by scouring dungeons of lower ranks outside of school hours, accompanied by a professional hunter. However, there is an exception, the student council of the high school of heroes. Within the institution, groups of students with exceptional grades are formed and recognized as an unofficial mop-up team. They are given the right to self-monitor and voice their opinions to the board. And may team up with professional teams to clear dungeons with danger levels above 5 stars. Therefore, student council members are unofficially considered to be future rankers. A member of the student council can only become a member from the first semester of sophomore year, and Han Jie Yun got in as soon as she finished her first semester. What happened next was that the girl challenged every member to a fight, moving up until she defeated every member, becoming the youngest president of the school. Jie Yun asked her uncle to stop nagging and said she had to go. But Chan held her back, offering her a bet if she beat him, they'd give her a seat. Chin Se tried to reason with her cocky friend, but her opponent said that if it was a bet, there was a stipulation in case she lost, too. 
Chan praised her for her smarts and said he'd heard of the shadow sparring technique. Shadow sparring is a technique based on ancient martial arts. It is forbidden to touch the opponent or dodge his attacks, and the first one to give in loses. This method protects the participants from damage, but significantly pumps technique and feelings. Therefore, it is used by hunters all over the world. Chan said that if she lost, he would take the student council president's seat next year when he entered the hero school. The pixie's legs gave a shake due to the excitement of what she heard, she tried to stop this argument, but she wasn't being listened to. There was no way Han would agree to this, she thought, if she was in her right mind. However, without further thought, Ga Yun accepted the young man's terms. Chapter 32 When Han Ga Yun left to prepare for the duel, leaving her friends alone, Jean Se made one last attempt to talk the young man who had made the bet out of it. It would be fine if his arm was intact, but in such a state he would not be able to win, but even if he won by some miracle, the Elphus warned that no one would give him the place of the president. Chan replied that he had no intention of winning even with a limb intact, Han was too strong an opponent for him. He understood his friend's confusion, but asked her to just trust him. Here the bout participants were already standing opposite each other in the atelier's costume testing arena. The president of the company grimly apologized to Jean S.E. for wasting her time to come to the meeting, but his niece is a stranger to tolerance, she reacts acutely to every word. The guest said that the man has nothing to apologize for, because her friend showed excessive stubbornness, and this is what it led to. The president grinned as he shared his suspicion that Jang Ren had not just made that bet for no reason he must have a purpose. Han Jie Yun informed the young man that she would also use one hand, that the fight was as fair as possible. Chan said that it didn't matter to him, but if she was preparing to lose, he wouldn't interfere with her. Suddenly, she threw a leg kick so fast that the guy barely dodged. Jin Se and Han Sung Yu opened their mouths at the same time, but the reasons for their surprise were completely different. Jean Sae was amazed by the girl's speed of movement. The essence of shadow sparring is to pump up defense and sense skills, but the student council leader's attacks were lightning fast, no hesitation or pause. It's extremely difficult to anticipate and react. Han Song, who used to be one of the best hunters, immediately realized Ga Yun's real goal he didn't want to humiliate Ga Yun and didn't show arrogance, but wanted to test her abilities. A little more and the boy would be able to handle a lower level ranger, but right now, Chang wanted to experience how much more he could grow to that level. When Sae Ram sent the preliminary results of the ability measurements, the man had already realized that he would be an outstanding and talented young man, but what he saw in person exceeded his expectations. Suddenly, Han Jie Yun stopped and a strange smile appeared on her face, a kind smile, and she said that she had not met an opponent who could last so long in a fight with her for a long time. Noting her opponent's condition, Han assumed he was moving several times slower than usual because of his injuries. Chang Ren grinned, wondering if the girl had seen him in his usual state. Unexpectedly to him, she explained that she had rewatched the video of the guy fighting the horned horror a hundred times in the past few days. You could say that she is a kind of fan of the unknown hero. She then suggested to settle for a draw, postponing the battle until Chan had moved on to hero school or was in perfect physical condition. She felt too sorry for such an outstanding talent to end it like this. However, the boy chuckled as he rose to his feet, wondering whether it was the girl's overconfidence or her inability to soberly assess the situation that had caused this decision. He is not going to end up with a draw, after all, the post of student council president is at stake. All three people present thought that the young man was bluffing. Even if they continue fighting, he still won't get anywhere. Han said that she liked daredevils, but now her opponent was being foolish instead of daring. However, she was interrupted by a lightning fast leg kick that the girl barely dodged. Jean Se thought she understood Chang Ren's plan to save her strength and then crush her tired opponent, but Han Song said that was not the case. He came to dread the realization of the young man's real plan. He didn't want to know the difference between him and Ji A Yun, this monster wanted to see her technique and adopt it. From an early age, Chang Ren had been smuggling to survive in this harsh world, so his main rule was not to make unfavorable deals. The series of attacks that followed really surprised the girl. Seeing her bewilderment, the guy ordered her to attack. Chapter 33 
Technique is more than just a punch with power invested in it. In order to hit the target accurately, it is necessary to take the optimal stance and position. You also need to watch your breathing in every step, even minor ones. It takes time to master these techniques. Some people devote years of hard training to it, go through successes and failures, learning lessons and knowledge. The experience gained is passed on to the next generation, improving each time. Even the most talented person could not achieve amazing results in a few years alone. Finally, when Chan Ren's development stalled at the age of 17, he met a wall that prevented him from progressing. For the sake of advancing to the next stage, he had to break down this wall. He threw off the bandage holding the cast and ordered his opponent to attack, unless of course she was afraid of losing. Han Jie Yun turned to her uncle, reminding him of his request to make at least one contract out of the dozen that had been offered to his niece. She promised to honor the request, but on one condition he must not stop her. The girl then turned to Chang Ren, saying that if he wanted to see how the best student of the Hero High School should fight, she would be happy to demonstrate it. There are connecting elements in human movements, every second they have a beginning and an end. Therefore, the watcher subconsciously assumes what action the person will perform next, such as continuing to walk calmly or breaking away and running. Han Jie Yun has learned to skip the in-between moment by tricking the opponent's vision. Moreover, she makes the opponent feel her speed. This is the same technique that made her father famous 20-odd years ago, Flash. The girl's uncle watched with interest and horror as Chang Ren repeated the flash several times in succession, using moves that Ji A Yun had yet to demonstrate. The man did not understand how this was possible, as it was impossible to repeat such a complex technique on one understanding. You need flexibility and agility, and most importantly, a sense of timing. He himself had learned the technique from his brother when he was 20, the age at which all abilities reached their peak. Even then, it had taken him three months just to understand it, but this guy was able to learn it during the fight with Ji A Yun, and in such a terrible condition. Han Sung Wu was right that after all that Chang Ren had endured, his strength was already running low. However, right now, he was feeling better than ever. The joy of learning something new that he had never experienced before was overwhelming. Even if it wasn't in a very familiar way, he had a goal, a motivation, and an understanding of how to achieve it. Chan had the impression that pain and fatigue were alien to him, but after making a few more movements, he fell to the floor at the touch of his opponent, and Han Jie Yun was glad that it was over quickly. At the same time, the former rivals admitted their defeat. However, Han Sung Wu ran up and explained that it was clear from the beginning that Jang Ren couldn't get the upper hand in such a state, so he, as an adult, had to stop the silly argument. So he suggested that the guys settle for a draw and have a real fight when the young man was fully recovered. The boy agreed. Han Jie Yun warned him that they would definitely see each other at school. But even if he didn't pass the exam by losing to someone else, she wouldn't leave him alone, then the girl turned around and walked towards the exit. For Chang Ren, today's battle, regardless of its outcome, was a very important and valuable lesson, because he had met a peer with amazing abilities and a worthy opponent that he must definitely defeat. However, Chang Ren was not the only one who felt a sense of joy today. Passing by the elven woman, Han asked her name, then apologized for today's incident and smilingly went to the elevator. Chapter 34 The friends were sitting in the luxurious office of Han Sung Wu, the president of the company. Chan felt so bad, as if he was about to die. Jean S. A. R. M. argued that it was his own fault no one had forced him to start that stupid fight, but Jang asked her to save her grumbling for later, he was dizzy enough as it was. Still, she recognized that it was all quite unexpected the result of the fight, and the fact that Chan himself admitted defeat. Although, if you follow the rules that were agreed, the young man won, because the opponent used his hands. However, Chan explained that initially it was clear that they were not going to easily hurt each other, but he was the first to cross the line, taking off the bandage and continuing the fight. The guy admitted that he had put all his strength into the last blow, if his leg had reached the target, the situation would not have been a simple painful one. Although he had calculated it so that he wouldn't touch Han Jie Yun, she couldn't do otherwise, and he would have used his hands in a similar situation. The Elphus asked what would have happened if he had been in a normal state. The friend said he couldn't answer that question accurately he was too caught up in the battle, he even enjoyed it. Suddenly, 
he stopped talking and jumped up from his seat. Han Sun Wu entered the room with an assistant and several packages of delicious pizza. The friends gorged themselves on the pizza, and the man apologized once again for his niece's behavior and decided to give them something tasty to eat as compensation for the inconvenience. Chang thanked the president for such a sign of attention he was not used to expensive food, he liked it bigger and tastier, and Chin Sae was surprised how her friend had eaten the whole box in just two minutes. The elf didn't even think about the fact that in those four days in the hospital, Chan hadn't even eaten once. The man began to tell her that their company made materials from a fabric that was far superior to leather in its characteristics. The thing is that the material used in production is not plant material, but synthetic material made from the threads of high-risk monsters, such as the four-star bandit spider. This requires a permit, which Mr. Han Wu's company certainly has. In the coating stage, the fabric is mixed with other materials, in proportions suited to each user individually. The proportions needed to produce a suit for Chan have already been calculated. However, there is one problem. The oil needed to make the costume is now almost impossible to obtain, so it will not be possible to fulfill the girl's request to create the best vestment of its kind, no matter how much it costs. In general, they use deep sea whale oil, which is very difficult to obtain. His company had a unique contract with the association, but due to an unknown anomaly, the miners couldn't find any monsters. The man said that other materials could be used, but due to the small difference, he could not guarantee the same efficiency. This was a slip-up that shouldn't have happened, so Han Song advised him to go to a craftsman he knows who also makes excellent suits, all expenses are covered by him, of course. But Chan objected it was important to him that the man who had taught his niece how to fight should make the costume for him. Especially since the man himself had claimed a small difference, and the young man had fought with almost no equipment before. Hearing her friend's words, Jean Se indicated that she wouldn't mind either. The former hunter was slightly embarrassed, but it was nice to hear such compliments for himself, after all, he had retired over a decade ago. As he stood up, he promised to make the best quality equipment, but mentioned the incident from a week ago. He really wanted to get his hands on one material that the heavenly wasps produced. The young man's eyes nearly rolled out of his eye sockets and the elf woman said that royal jelly was a very precious material, but the man meant something else. He was talking about black wax while royal jelly nourishes the uterus, black wax protects the queen. Even among the wasps themselves, a small number of individuals can produce this wax, with which they lubricate the body of the uterus, and by coating metal with this substance, one could obtain armor of excellent quality. Chan pulled out his phone and showed a drawing of the black octagon, he said he would have shown a picture, but the old phone had crashed, so he sketched it here. Han Song was surprised if the guy had a picture, he had seen the sky wasp himself. Chan Wen wanted to tell the truth, but he knew what the penalty for smuggling was, and he couldn't trust a man he'd known for a couple hours. The young man said he'd seen the wax at Qin Sei's house, something rich people don't have. Jang Ren's employer, Jae Hwan spoke to his mentee on the phone, sitting by the bedside of Yu Sung, who was hooked up to a ventilator. All of the once great hunter's veins were glowing purple the effect of the dragon poison. Suddenly, footsteps were heard in the corridor and Huang said that the one he expected had come and ended the call. Zeke Esserm entered the chamber. The elf greeted the young man, but he offered to leave the patient had just taken a sedative and fell asleep, and besides, this was a hospital, no noise was allowed. Eleven years ago, the once legendary mop-up squad was disbanded, led by one man, with Zeke as the healer of the Venus squad and Im Jae Hwan as the main fighter and hunter, once ranked fifth in the South Korean rankings. The two who once called themselves comrades met again. The elf said that if the interlocutor kept quiet, it would be over quickly. The young man noted that the annoying way of speaking inherent in the arrogant Esserm had gone nowhere. Zeke ordered them to shut up and follow him. Chapter 35 The friends stood outside the company building. Jean S.E. with a disgruntled expression on her face asked Chan to warn her in advance next time. She assumed that the black wax that Han Sun Wu was talking about was in that trunk they found at the mall. The young man thanked her for playing along, explaining that he didn't know about the contents of that briefcase himself. The girl asked her buddy about his free time today, but he informed her that he had to meet someone. Suddenly Chin's cell phone rang, the screen caption surprised her very much, Uncle Zeke. 
The president of the company came out and asked if SAE Ram had already left, but the guy explained that his friend had gone to talk on the phone, but it wouldn't take long, but Han Sung said he didn't come to talk, he just wanted to smoke. In the process, he praised the young man for the brilliant moves he'd demonstrated today, and said that his brother had invented the technique, but he himself had a hand in transforming it as well. Suddenly, Chang Ren leaned over and apologized Han Sung had worked so hard to perfect the flash, he shouldn't have used it without permission. However, the man reassured that he hadn't brought up the technique to apologize. Although unique techniques are rarely passed on to each other, there is no copyright of any kind on techniques between hunters. Especially, it is not considered a crime if a warrior mastered a technique on his own. Since Chan was able to do this, it meant that he had a very high level from the beginning. The guy became embarrassed, saying that his movements weren't perfect, but his interlocutor objected that the conversation was once again going the wrong way. The first time he saw Chang Ren, he thought that the young man only knew basic techniques, but his face with eyes sparkling with fire made it clear that such a spunky young man wouldn't stop at the simplest techniques. Han Song then gave his advice to not stop there. As a former hunter, he explained that with proper perseverance and training, Chan would make a first-class hunter, perhaps the best there ever was. Most, of course, would recognize his abilities and look up to him. But in the harsh world of hunters, there are those who will not put up with anyone above them such villains will try to get the more talented warrior, and if they can't get him, destroy him. Chan asked if he had to hide his abilities for that reason. But Han Song objected that he did not. On the contrary, one must show them in all their glory, build an image of a genius who is hard to befriend, learn ever more complex techniques, and do everything in his power to make the abilities reach their limit. Even the unnatural modesty of a young man will still not be able to hide such power, so it is necessary to do everything possible not to look like a weakling who can be easily crushed. There was no need to apologize for using someone else's technique, as was done just now. If you manage to master it yourself and become stronger, then it is already your technique. Han Song laughed, suggesting that this was not the kind of advice an adult should give, but in the harsh world of hunters, the rule of thumb is that whoever is stronger is right. His niece has a very bad temper and as an adult he has to reprimand her, but he doesn't want to break her confidence, because as long as she is feared, no one can hurt her and so should Chang Ren. Their conversation was interrupted by Jean Se asking her friend to pick up the phone. He was surprised that he had to take her calls. The Elphus explained that it was her uncle, somehow he'd found out where she dragged Chang Ren and asked her to give the phone to him. Zeke apologized if he had distracted the young man, but something unforeseen had happened, so they needed to get to the specified location right away. Han Sung and Sae Ram got excited when the guy said he was on his way out. Jang and the elf girl walked down to the abandoned subway station where Jae Hwan's hideout was located. The guy was explaining to his friend that not only in this, but other subways as well, there were secret passages to dungeons hidden from the eyes of the association, and each such passage had its own master. Upon entering the station, the guys found Zeke Azerm and his friend who was giving the elf a ride in a convertible, Kong Gong Ho and both were wearing torn clothes, you'd think they'd gotten into a fight. Kong Gong Ho was excited to meet the guy who was called scarier than a high threat level monster. Suddenly, Zeke announced that it was time to leave business was over, and it wasn't worth lingering here. Chin quietly asked to call later. Chan opened the door leading to the dungeon rock. At its very edge sat a shabby looking Jae Hwan and when asked what had happened he heard in reply that Hwan's self-confidence and body were simply shattered. He added that this elf was just pathetic obediently following him, but still bringing support. Chan wondered what had happened. His employer said he shouldn't worry about it, but still hinted that that second one held the defense pretty well, even without being a tank, and would probably be a great hunter in ten years, with about a quarter of Yusong's strength. The young man wanted to say something about something, but Huang realized without words that Chang Ren wanted to drop the smuggling. He said he would allow it, but with one condition the boy would master what Jay would show him in a month, and if he didn't, he shouldn't even think about becoming a hunter. It won't be easy as it is somewhat different from the lad's skills. With a smile on his face, Jang saw how his interlocutor made the cigarette but he had in his hand levitate, meaning Jae Hwan was going to teach him magic. Chapter 36 Chang Ren was eager to find out why he wanted to learn magic, but first he decided to listen to what Huang had to tell him. He took a couple steps and almost fell, 
but the young man managed to pick him up and dragged him to the station, asking him to rest. As he touched the broker's body, Chan felt that it was eerily cold, it was definitely not simple fatigue. Yu Song took the boiling kettle off the stove, he never thought that grinding and brewing coffee beans would prove so easy. When he worked as a hunter, he could easily find time for this activity as well. 26-year-old M. Jae Hwan, sitting across from him, asked his comrade not to speak in the past tense, as if he had given up hunting with the ends. Sung objected not as if, but exactly. However, the fellow didn't let him finish, blurting out that all he had to do to recover was catch Daganahai and he wouldn't even have to do anything if he officially announced the purpose of the raid and assembled a squad. However, Yu Song explained that even then, there was no way to catch the dragon it would simply lurk and wait out the raid in a secluded place, and then continue to do evil as if nothing had happened. Jay shouted, saying that it wasn't just Daganahi, those silly rumors could have been put to rest a long time ago if they'd wanted to. He asked the leader to let them do it all themselves, and when Sun recovered, they would bring all the ungrateful creatures to their knees. A thump on the table startled a small boy standing at the entrance to the room. The hunter asked the child not to be afraid of Uncle Jae Hwan, and then informed him that he would be going to bed soon. Seeing the confused face of the student, Yu Sung introduced the guest to his son. The father asked the boy to play alone and said he would call him for dinner soon. Left alone with Huang again, the man said he wouldn't last much longer. Zeke, of course, had created an anesthetic from the milk of the celestial tiger, but he would soon become resistant to it as well. But pain was another matter, as his intellect, memory, and perception would gradually deteriorate, and in another three or four years he would no longer recognize people. The interlocutor said that this was something that needed to be prevented, but suddenly the man stood up and asked Jae Hwan to replace Jang Ryong as his father when all of the above happened. This was the first time something like this had happened the great Yu Sung, who never showed his weaknesses under any circumstances, made a request to another man. The young man simply could not refuse his friend. Huang woke up lying on the bed and felt much better, and the bruises and abrasions were gone from his face. The young man asked his mentee if he had really let that freak touch his body. Chan explained that he wanted to take his employer to the hospital, but he didn't know how to describe the condition, so he just gave him a shot. This emergency potion had been a gift from Jay himself in honor of the young man's start, of course, it wasn't a panacea, but it could help in many cases. The medicine can restore the person taking it for two or three hours, a luxury even for professional hunters, but once used it can be used. When 14-year-old Chan was going on his first mission, the guardian said that if the boy wasn't sure, he could cancel now, but if he agreed, he couldn't just cancel in the future. However, Ren countered that he had long wanted to gain the ability to protect his ailing father in any situation. The young man praised him for not putting the drug on the black market. Huang said that even if the young man hadn't become a smuggler, he would still be paying for his father's treatment. Jang replied that he understood that, though he wasn't 100% sure. Jay countered that he'd already betrayed Yu Sung by making his 14-year-old son a criminal, but the guy said that he would have found another way otherwise. However, he really wondered why Huang had agreed to help so easily. The young man said that Song asked him not to make his son a hunter, but it's not just that. He hates this stupid world. He hates the bastards who drove his friend to this state, the idiots who believed the lies, and the freaks who knew but didn't mind. He wants them all dead. Chan said that Zeke wants to help, but Huang again wouldn't listen and said that this elf is just a fool and no matter how sincere his intentions are, his methods are too naive, there's no way he can catch Daganahai. Dragons are the most cunning creatures of this world, so made it so that their destruction would result in huge losses. Yes, he's put together a good squad and both sides know it, but the blind idiots who betrayed you Sung won't believe even the truest facts, so as long as Zeke is tied to the law and the government, they'll only get in the way by helping the dragons. Soon, the horror that destroyed the young man's father would return and everyone would get what they deserved, so Song didn't want his son to become a hunter. Finishing his story, Jay handed Chan a sheet with the number of the bank account into which he had been saving the money the young smuggler had earned since his earliest days. Chan didn't understand why he needed the money and the guardian explained that he had long ago decided to give it to the boy to start his own business when he grew up. Now he would teach him new techniques and knowledge, even more dangerous than the future hunters were learning. 
In the meantime, he could prepare to enroll, though there wasn't much point in doing so. Chang Ren wondered then why not just object then, why give him another chance? Huang explained that three years ago, before his first assignment, the ward had already said what he wanted to do, so that was the most important thing. Chapter 37 Somewhere in the neighborhood of Old Yongsan, a criminal was sneaking between the ruins of high-rise buildings, arranging to hijack a monster truck, causing the horned horrors to get out. Entering one of them, she found a guy in a respirator mask, who continued to read a book, not paying attention to the appearance of the girl. She complained that it was time to get a headquarters for meetings, but the guy said that she rarely showed up anyway. Not to be silent, the girl drew attention to the fact that he was alone, insulting the silent interlocutor as a puppy without an owner. He ordered her to shut up, but the bully wouldn't stop. So he threw the book to the ground with force and said that he would not be punished if he taught her a lesson. They got ready to fight, but were interrupted by a man in a white mask. He said he didn't want to interfere in their squabble, but he had to explain that he had gathered them all because of a matter he didn't want to do alone because of the foolishness of his handmaidens. Tvesik, that was the guy's name, apologized for answering to that crazy fool. Heron replied that the rival was lucky to have a boss come in and then asked why the man didn't answer the phone. At first he didn't understand, but then he remembered the operation three days ago and said that there was no need to listen to nonsense like the girl would go down and kill the rescuers herself, especially since the operation was successful. Tvesik didn't quite understand why the boss called the operation a success. Okay this dead ten civilians, but the news did not say a word about the seizure of the truck, all kept talking about some guys. But the masked man explained that it was a natural result the government must have made arrangements with the families of the dead to shift attention from their mistakes to the heroism of the two boys. Heron shouted that in that case she should have killed them all herself, but the boss countered that in that case they would be labeled terrorists, and the attention of ordinary people would be focused on catching the criminals. Because of such actions, the association would not collapse, but only strengthen its position. Because of one blunder, there will be no question about the organization, but if these blunders continue to be repeated, it will be a real death blow. Suddenly, another young man appeared at the meeting place with his hands covered in blood. The masked man apologized that the guest had to be torn away from his hobby, but the matter was urgent. He objected that it was not a hobby, but a job, which, it must be admitted, was enjoyable. A disfigured man followed the young man on a chain wrapped around his arm, his body covered with bruises and cuts and blood, and a sack over his head. Tvesik concluded that, judging by his physique, he was a hunter, and the leader of the crowd confirmed his guess that he was indeed a hunter whose name had recently appeared in the rankings. He was caught trying to sell treasures on the black market under the guise of a smuggler. Yunjio, the newcomer's name, said that this tank was a scary person although he was a junior member of the squad, he was promoted in every possible way, and he decided to secretly appropriate all the loot for himself, hiding it in the shadows. The girl asked about the shadow and the gang leader explained that the shadow was the secret hideout of the hunters. Usually, they set up small bases where there are dungeons and inside this space, which monsters can't get into, there is an infirmary, quarters and other necessary items, but not everyone uses shadows for their intended purpose, some do what they want there, if they need a secret place hidden from the eyes of others. Goel tugged the captive's neck, asking him to repeat what he had said earlier. The hunter told him that there would be a party in the shadows tonight, everyone would come even the leader and civilians would be there. Tvesik didn't understand why members of the elite units were socializing with smugglers, but the other guy asked to listen to the end and ordered the captive to continue. Then added to not stuttering, it's so infuriating it makes you want to kill someone. Tank said that the leader of their group invited his friends, and these are businessmen, stars and other famous people, who will drink or take potions with relaxing effect. The gang leader had a rough idea of what kind of rabble would gather in the shadows drug addicts looking for a thrill in the dungeons, although there was no safer place for their dirty fun, given that they would be guarded by hunters. The captive hunter shook with terror. Yunjiu calmed the victim with the affectionate voice of a psychopath, saying he wouldn't hurt him anymore. The boss announced that now he would unfortunately have to be let go. The man then said there would not be a living soul left there tonight. Elite hunters and ordinary civilians in a highly drugged state were torn apart by the monsters in the dungeon, was the truth that the whole world would know. Yunjiu asked if the boss would let them do it all by themselves. 
The man said there shouldn't be a problem, because this is what they've always wanted, chaotic mass slaughter. Their target is an elite squad of hunters two golds and six rankers, and the enemy is strong enough for his underlings to relieve all the stress they've accumulated. Once their bodies are discovered, the stench of corpse decomposition will finally wake this world up, which means it won't be long before it's time for their scar squad. A month later, Chang Ren was riding in a cab, talking to someone on the phone and told them that he would be arriving in two minutes. He also said that the cast had been removed in the morning, but that his arm was still weak, and that it would take some time for his nervous system to recover. Jean S.E., who was on the other end of the line, said she saw a cab and waved happily. Getting out of the car, the young man opened his mouth at the building he saw. The girl said it was for practicing with Juan, and she had to get ready for the credits. Tyr Belkison got out from the other side of the rear passenger seat and Chan explained to his girlfriend that they met in the hospital in the morning and talked about the exams. By the way, they'd be in the same class if Say Ram didn't mind. The big guy got shy and lowered his head. Chapter 38 Jean Say decided to take a tour of the training center, which included the main training room along with the swimming pool. There's a recreation area with free food. There's a weight room where all the machines have special weights and are designed for hunters. There's also men's and women's dormitories and a spa complex. Chan couldn't believe that all of this belonged to the elven uncle. But she explained that it was no surprise some ranchers had bought out entire mountains and built training fields in their place. Zeke sometimes came here with his colleagues to train, but the rest of the days the center was at their disposal. Seeing Tyr looking at the barbell pancakes with interest, Chin wondered what it was. Chang objected that a classmate couldn't be called it. The girl explained that the boy probably didn't consider her his classmate. The young man asked if she'd ever spoken to him. Chin said that everyone knows about Tyr's arrogance, he doesn't even pay attention to the honor students, and not even to her. Chan then summoned his mate here, saying that they hadn't come here to have fun. Unexpectedly to the elf, Tyr apologized he had always wanted to try the brand. On the way to the training center, they were just discussing the girl. When Tyr found out that the one who was helping Chan, he got excited and Chan said that if they had a bad relationship, he could think of something, but the big guy said it was fine. It's just that he's always been afraid of Jean Say, but at the same time he thought she was cool. Hearing those words, Ren couldn't figure out if it was exactly the Jean Say they were talking about right now, but Tyr confirmed his answer. Although she wasn't very quick-witted, it was clear from her freshman year that she wasn't the type to give up quickly. She knew that many students disliked her, but she always kept her head straight. He couldn't say anything about her grades, but her classmates' steadfastness and tenacity had always fascinated the big guy. Chan asked what his friends thought about the threesome practicing this weekend. Jean S. E. objected, since he had to study for his exams, which were only a month away. The young man said it's just memorizing and analyzing, not putting skills into practice. Preparation was certainly important, but they could spend this time much more efficiently. Chan went on to explain that he had personally encountered strong people over the past month, adopting their techniques that he could share with his friends. They would be able to share knowledge and give each other evaluations, it would not only be beneficial to him, but to them as well. He didn't want to remind them that they were considered outcasts in their schools, and if he switched to them, he wanted to share knowledge with his friends. He then turned to Jean Say, saying that it wasn't just his exam that was important right now, but her session as well. He would get in, but the elf could be kept back for a second year or kicked out altogether. Chin said she realized she couldn't teach them anything. However, Chan objected that this was not true and asked Tyr if he knew how to use magic and Tyr replied that so far he had only listened to theory in classes and then Chan explained that their friend was an archer mage who used magic skillfully, though she could not combine it with other techniques properly. In that case, Tyr said that he had wanted to learn magic for a long time so he could use it somewhere. Tyr hoped he looked natural enough, and Chan asked his friend where to change. Fifteen minutes later in the dueling room, Chin Sae asked where her buddy had gone, to which Ren replied that he was on the phone with his parents. Picking her moment, the Elphus thanked Chan for taking some sort of guardianship over them. She never thought she'd be friends with anyone else, much less the silent tear. Now, it seemed, she realized that the classmate wasn't so bad. Suddenly, a few more high school students entered the room. 
The snow white hair and voice that annoyed Jean S.E. so much, it was Anisha. Rom was surprised to see her cousin here since her uncle wasn't here right now. The girl countered that Zeke had given her permission to use the hall any time he wasn't here. Seeing Chan's confused face, her friend introduced her cousin Anisha Esserm to him. The snow white haired elf pretended to be pleased that her cousin had brought a friend. She then introduced her friends, whom she invited to socialize and at the same time train here. Anisha reminded her that her sister didn't like to be around a lot of people, however, if she decided to leave, others might think she had been kicked out. If she asked, they would gladly take her into the company, it would be a good opportunity for her. Seeing that her friend was confused, Chang Ren interjected into the conversation and asked if he and another one of their buddies could also join the training together. The sophomore who was with Anisha asked the guy what school he was attending. Chan replied that he was a freshman at a regular high school but was preparing to transfer. A sophomore named Jang Sang Young advised the young man to get in his car and get out. He was supported by Anisha as well as it is, her friend is an ordinary person, so he is not allowed to train with the students of the hero school. Chan tried to justify himself, but Sanyin punched the guy in the face and he screamed in pain. It was clear that he wasn't going to hit him seriously. Even professional hunters weren't allowed to touch ordinary people, it was considered a criminal offense. Jan just wanted to wave his hand at the guy's face to show the difference in levels. He should have dodged backwards automatically, but he put his head under the blow. But to do that, one would have to calculate everything perfectly. Covering his face with his hands, Chan lamented that he only wanted to be friends and practice together, but the guys had crossed the line. Suddenly, he raised his head with a smile, saying that there was nothing he could do, he would have to defend himself. Chapter 39 Depending on the scale, cameras were installed in the hunters' training halls to record everything that happened there. The recordings were then reviewed, and the warriors would analyze their movements, working on their mistakes. Chin Se knew about this as well, so she was happy to have a safety net in the form of a recording of a hero high school student firing his fists for no good reason. She didn't know what Chang Ren was up to, but she realized that he had set the situation up, as evidenced by the overly fake shaking. San Young interjected about self-defense. Chan explained that he was a reserved person by nature, so when trouble happened, he couldn't sleep well, constantly remembering that moment. The sophomore apologized for the punch, but said that the guy was exaggerating, because there weren't even any wounds left. The young man turned to Jean Sae and started cursing that Jang was the one who started the fight and now he's accusing the victim of exaggerating the attack and asked the elf girl whether he should call the police or go straight to the school administration. Then San Young asked to stop and asked what the guy wanted money or, indeed, to participate in the training. But Jang said he would defend himself, because he wouldn't be able to sleep well if he didn't return the favor. Chan thought the guy was crazy, but told him to try to hit him. He figured that since the psycho was in a regular school, one flimsy punch would be the best way to get rid of him. However, at the crucial moment, Jan dodged, causing a flurry of outrage from his friends. The sophomore dodged by circling the insolent youngster, that was how the picture looked in the eyes of others. However, from San Yang's own perspective, it was different if he hadn't dodged the fist, he would have felt the full force of his opponent's power. Chan said that such a deception was a bit hurtful. Then Anisha told her friend to finally admit his mistake, apologize and make amends. Jan tried to apologize, but Chan countered that fighting was the only option to resolve the issue. Angry at the youngster's insolence, the sophomore ordered an attack. Chan Ren snapped out of his seat and ran forward. He moved so fast that Jiang could barely keep up with his movement. Suddenly, he felt a pain in the area of his nose. A mockingly weak punch and a look that said, I hit you let's call it a day, was enough to make the hero school student furious. A series of quick attacks were unsuccessful. When the moment was right, Chang made a slashing motion and put his raging opponent on the floor. He apologized, saying he didn't mean to mock, he just wanted to see if he could fight without getting hurt and extended his hand to his fallen opponent. Seeing his friend's taunts, Jan turned away from Chan. The young man then turned to Jean S.E., asking to take the camera footage. She asked what else he was going to do here, but the guy calmed her friend down, explaining that these records were for her he moved as slowly as possible, so that she could see everything in detail. The girl realized that he had originally started the fight for her and Chan had said so, that was true, 
but he wasn't the one who started the bullying first, that was a fact. He asked the elven girl about her cousin. From what Tyr had told him, Chin Se didn't really bend to Anisha, which was why she was an outcast. When Chan gets to their school, he wants to make friends, but he's not going to grovel to anyone. Their conversation was interrupted by Jiang Sang Yun, who tried to attack the winner from behind. Suddenly, he was stopped by Anisha herself using magic. The girl accused her friend of not having the basic qualities of a hunter, but at the same time dishonoring her as well. Suddenly Chang Ren felt uneasy and his hand began to glow purple again. Chapter 40th Three weeks ago, Chang Ren had received a package of old stuff from the medical center he had been taken to after his encounter with the King of Horned Horrors. He didn't hold out much hope, but now it was some junk and even the Enkill blood had probably lost its properties by now. In situations that threatened the user's life, the blood and kill would produce and absorb magical energy. The moment he was attacked by terror, he felt something in his pocket activate. He probably survived because of that thing, but the power that awakened afterward, could it really be the medallion's effect as well, at least he had no other explanation. However, it's hardly some hidden power like in girls' comics. Its minimum price in the market is over 2 billion won, no wonder it has such effects for that kind of money. Suddenly, his musings were interrupted by a sudden realization he had just lost over 2 billion won. Here and now, he was experiencing the same feeling. But why did it happen again, maybe it wasn't the medallion at all. Anisha approached him, asking how much his cousin had promised him, she would pay several times the amount plus liquidated damages if he agreed to work with her. Chin Se called the words nonsense, but Anisha countered that it wasn't nonsense, it was a good business proposition. After all, she was stronger than the sophomore, even if not the strongest, but still, her cousin had asked if it was strange that no one knew the name of such a talented young man, even if he hadn't managed to get into the school of heroes. There must have been circumstances that prevented it, but most such matter is solved with money, and money is Say Ram's strong point. With a wry smile, Anisha wondered if there was anything else that kept a guy like that around ability, ability to make friends, or reputation, and if that didn't fit, what else did? Chan interjected into the cousin's conversation, saying that the main quality that kept him around Chin was patience, and though he hadn't noticed it personally, she seemed to have some nasty thing attached to her that was ruining the best years of school. The guy assumed that she wouldn't understand it, since she doesn't know how to say things to her face, but she's been scheming behind her back, but it looks like the exchange won't happen this week. Anisha stopped conjuring, and the sophomore fell to the floor with a thud. Seeing that the white-haired elf was about to leave, her friend sounded the alarm, for they had invited not only classmates, but upperclassmen as well. The girl was angry why invite the upperclassmen when their leader was now lying on the floor. Anisha said that it was just an excuse to make acquaintances with the student council and she was sorry for the wasted time. She then turned to Chan, advising him to choose his friends more carefully next time, unless, of course, it was only Jean Se's money that was keeping him around. Chan was surprised that this was a mage who could not be bothered to fight. However, even the departure of her rival did not make Sae Ram happy she realized that her cousin would not give up so easily, probably, she had already found out everything about the young man and was already preparing a plan to harm him. She would probably spread the information all over the school. By the way, he couldn't feel anything now, the effect had stopped when Anisha had stopped conjuring. So it didn't depend on the medallion, it was a power that appeared in response to magic. The pondering was interrupted by the elf who asked if everything was alright with her friend. He reassured her, explaining that she would have to work harder to master magic. When the sophomore woke up, he saw a tear above him and immediately remembered the freshman who had defeated the horned horror. The big guy informed Chan that Jan had woken up. As he approached, the boy apologized once more he had intended to land one blow, but his opponent had gotten a lot more, even though it was his own fault. Sang Young was quick to say it was his fault, he didn't even know he was dealing with the hero of the Kwangak district tragedy, so he acted like a pig, but it was good that he didn't fight at full strength. Chan stated that he didn't think the sophomore had a chance of winning anyway. Although their stats were almost the same, it felt like the opponent didn't know how to control his emotions. There were also some moments where habits were evident. While Jan lay unconscious, the young man had time to analyze the records of the battle. The first was the center of gravity, the fact that before the arms went into action, 
the supporting leg shook slightly. There are a couple other things that Chan pointed out in the notes. Chin Se assumed that the senior was very surprised right now. It was understandable, money couldn't buy such an analysis. Jang did wonder how Chang Ren had been able to notice all that, and Chang asked if Sang Yun knew about his shortcomings, and Sang Yun replied that he knew some of the information, but he was ashamed of his behavior. Chan reassured him, saying that he had paid for his mistake in full. The guy said that since the sophomore had come to practice, he could familiarize himself with the notes and then put the phone down, and if he left his number, there would be an opportunity to forward it. Stepping back, Chan complained about the senior's friends who'd left him unconscious, and Tyr suggested that he must be hurting right now. Chin Se said that since everyone was done, she could at least talk about the basic concept of magic. In simple terms, magic power is like fuel for magic, and the quality of that fuel depends on its performance. Chang asked whether it was quality or quantity, and Tyr explained that it was quality, because if you compare it by quantity, there is not much difference between humans and, for example, elves. Chin Sae said that her magic at level C was the lowest level from which it could be used successfully attacking the enemy or putting buffs on the abilities of her comrades. For those like them who don't consider themselves mages, it would also be useful to learn how to put buffs on their abilities. Chan asked if he could learn it over the weekend. Chin replied that it was theoretically possible, but it takes beginners one to two weeks just to set up. Besides, she had only studied long-range buffs, but suddenly Jang Sanyang intervened in the conversation and said that he could help with it if they agreed to learn from him. After all, he was the best at mastering self-buffs in his course. Chapter 41 Chang Ren couldn't believe his eyes and feelings when he got to create a small fire, an F-rank spell used during camping or emergency situations. However, Chan said that it would have been stranger if the young man hadn't been able to do it, because anyone with the skills present could use magic, you just had to figure out how to awaken it. Chan asked with interest what they would do next create more fire or maybe water. However, the older student said that for now he should just keep the small fire and concentrate on himself. Seeing Chan's surprised look, the mentor explained that feeling magic in the first class was like trying to catch a cloud, that you couldn't feel something you had never used. However, the situation was different now Chan had managed to create a small, but still a spark. In other words, he himself didn't even notice that he had activated his magic powers, this is the initial stage of sensing. Now San Young asked his student to concentrate and try to hold that spark and if he felt anything inside, that would be the first step. Chan closed his eyes and suddenly said that he felt some kind of tickling tingling sensation, as if a current was spreading upwards all over his body, the young man asked is this it or not. At first, the mentor was confused he thought it would take him all weekend, but he was able to achieve it in less than a minute and confirmed his hunch by saying that it was probably the same sensation. Chan went on to describe his sensations it felt to him as if there were hundreds of wires inside his body with electricity flowing through them. There are two parts of the human body that are responsible for magical power, the core, which is just above the navel, is responsible for mana. And the electrical circuitry coming out of the nucleus spreads that mana throughout the body and there are just over 127 threads in that circuitry. Meanwhile, Chin Sae Ram had taken to teaching magic to Tyr Belkison and asked if he could play any instruments. The classmate replied that he had studied the piano until he was 10 years old. Then Chin created a thunder fist, a D-rank spell, although this ball filled with lightning can be launched at a speed of 200 km per hour, its killing power is quite low. The Elphus explained to her classmate that she didn't move much when creating this ball. Despite popular belief, creating magic isn't such a noisy activity. It's like playing the piano when one presses a certain key at a certain time and it's the same with magic. The system inside the body consists of 127 strings or keys from which you select the right ones in a special order and at a special time, that's how magic is used. Tyr asked what would happen if the order and timing were disturbed, would there be a risk of improper effects? She explained that if the errors were small, it would not affect anything, but the more complex and powerful the magic, the higher the probability of failure, even with the slightest mistake. Naturally, the danger to oneself would also increase from a failed throw. Chin Se drew her classmate's attention to the thunder fist she had created, and although it was only a D-rank spell, it was enough to send an inept user into a blackout for half a day, and if you took even C-rank magic, 
a single mistake could be fatal. Therefore, it is very important that the front line cover the mages during the battle, because it is very difficult to maintain concentration in an emergency situation. The girl asked if the young man could sense magic and Tyr said that he sometimes practiced it, but he wasn't quite capable of it yet. Chin Se explained that it would be enough to learn only the basic techniques so that there would be enough for the buffs, as the tank didn't need to understand all the intricacies of the art. Chan watched with a smile as his friends, who not long ago had been afraid to even cross their eyes, interacted. Jan noticed his student's unusual stance, wondering if he wanted to go to the restroom and Chan shared with his mentor the decision to stop training. Jan wondered what was the reason for this decision, after all, with the boy's talents, he needs to train hard. However, the young man objected that he had already felt the magic, knew the number of threads and knew where the system was, but the senior student still couldn't understand how Chan managed to make progress so quickly. To confirm his words, he reported that there were two threads in his right arm, one in his wrist, three in his elbow, there were slightly more in his left arm eight, but if you counted from the shoulder, there were ten. When the mentor heard this, he accused Chan of showing off and making a show as if he had already learned everything. The young man then asked the senior to show him more techniques. Chin Se didn't know what happened between the comrades, but she assumed that her friend had done something in his style again. There is a slight difference among humans, but usually, the arrangement of the system and threads are all about the same and for this reason, each thread has a different number from 1 to 127. Jan punched the air in front of Chan's face and asked him to memorize well what his fist was like without magic. He then said that he would now cast the muscle tension buff, an earrank spell. Chan struck again, but the speed and power had increased by leaps and bounds. Jang concluded that if the fist had reached its target, it would have been nothing short of a broken nose. San Young revealed that he was among the underclassmen in his freshman year. His physical attributes were top notch, but he lacked the sense of how to properly utilize those attributes. But luckily, he had an aptitude for magic, so he discovered this amazing method buffs. Jan often wondered if one buff gave such a wonderful effect, what would happen if you applied several at once. However, the others only learned two or three and stopped there, while Jang collected them by the dozens. As a result, by his second year, he managed to improve his grades and even became the team leader, but the other students from the faculty didn't take him seriously, believing that he was using cheap tricks. That was why he had gladly accepted Anisha's exchange offer, hoping that he could teach something to the younger ones, and that was why he was acting like an idiot. Suddenly, Chan tilted his head and apologized to the younger man for the behavior he had displayed when they first met. Jang grabbed his new buddy by the shoulders and told him to stop apologizing with words for 52 hours until Monday morning, he would look forward to a good lesson with his mentor. From the look on Jang Sanyang's face, one couldn't think he was happy about this, but there was no turning back now. Chapter 42 all four of them went outside. Chan took a deep breath of the fresh morning air and said it was just what they needed after three days of training and Chin Se said he sounded like some kind of uncle. She didn't expect them to make full use of the training center all weekend instead of sleeping. Then she looked at her friends, surprised at their cheerfulness. However, these three days had indeed turned out to be very valuable this kind of training, with them helping each other out, was proving to be very beneficial. Jan told Tyr that if they had been in the center, they could have caught up on a bowl of soup, it was a pity they didn't make it here. Chan told his friends that he'd called a cab and asked if anyone was heading towards Kanam, there was a practice session today, so it wouldn't be a good idea to stop by the school. Jang said he would go, but he could be dropped off at the nearest second-line subway station. Suddenly, he turned to his friends, thanking them for a wonderful time this was his best weekend since his fifth birthday. He informed them that they wouldn't see each other again until the exam started, because everyone had to study. Then he asked them to keep an eye on each other, it would be difficult, of course, but at least say hello to each other once in a while. Finally, Chang said goodbye, saying that they would see each other again. Jin Se called out to Jang Sanyang who was standing aside, thanking him for the knowledge she had learned from him. The senior praised her for her efforts and then got into the car. As the two T.E. Jang and Sang Yun drove away, the Elphus awkwardly informed Tyr that the car would be here soon, they were still uncomfortable being alone together. Upon reaching their destination, Chan thanked his buddy again for the skills and buffs he had learned over the weekend, 
reminding him of the special move. The senior cautioned that it was just an idea, so it might not work in practice. But he said that he would try it out in a rematch, he just had to get the hang of it. Jan asked about a rematch, but Chan said it was a long story. He then suggested that they have lunch together sometime. San Young said that in that case, the guy should transfer soon, since he wouldn't waste his time with a student from some regular school. Chang thanked his buddy for his support and the two went their separate ways. Upon arriving home, Chan found that, indeed, he was tired, but he still had to go to school today. A voice from the living room informed him that there was no need to go to school, but it would not be possible to get a good night's sleep anyway. Jae Huan walked into the room and saw Jae Huan there. The boy said that today was a weekday, but the boss explained that he had already managed to warn the principal that Chan would be gone for a month, so if he didn't want to distinguish himself for a hundred percent attendance, he could pack his things, a few t-shirts and underwear would suffice for now. Suddenly, Huang sensed that his ward had already been trained in magic, only the beginning stages so far, but the circuitry had awakened. Chan said that he had learned in advance what the lessons would be about, so he had decided to prepare a little and Jay praised the boy for his diligence, but regretted that he had to waste his time on nonsense. Noticing the surprise on the young man's face, Huang reminded his words that their lessons were not some private lessons, but an exam. Chan must become a true hunter, so the guardian will do his best to see if he's ready for it. And will also do his best to make him realize that his abilities aren't outstanding at all, so he should start packing. So far, only the necessities if anything was missing, Huang had promised to give it away. Suddenly he was leaning over some kind of case, cursing at the lid, which would not open. Chan inquired what it was and the mentor replied that it was the young man's weapon some annoying type had learned his address and sent the thing. Finally, the suitcase opened, and Huang beckoned the lad to take a look. Inside lay a pole, sheathed in a metal pattern on both sides, and Jay said that if the elf had tampered with it, he would sue. Upon picking up the weapon, however, Chan noticed that it was lighter and the ends were stronger. Huang said that if the lad had a desire to try out the pole, he could provide that opportunity and Chan replied that he looked forward to it. Chan stood in the middle of the forest facing his opponent. A carnivorous ant with three danger stars was approaching him. He recalled the rule his guardian had once taught him when encountering a three-star monster, one should flee, and encounters with more dangerous monsters were best avoided. Huang countered that this was the rule of smugglers, but not of hunters. The man told Chan to call him for help as soon as he felt he was failing and thought he had first seen Chan's abilities six months ago. The flesh-eating elf was especially dangerous at close range and if the kid's level stayed the same as it had six months ago, he'd probably die. Lastly, Huang reminded him that asking for help would mean failure. The fight had begun. Though fully concentrated, Chan's head would have flown off his shoulders if he had removed his head a moment later. He had met monsters of the four danger stars before, the difference between Ent and Horror was not that great, but without a comrade, any hiccup could cost a life. Therefore, it is necessary to destroy the enemy as soon as possible. The biggest difference between three and four stars is the intelligence level of the monsters. They could assess the situation on the battlefield just like humans, and especially strong monsters could even influence the psyche. Chan realized that such a monster could not be penetrated by a needle. Huang realized this and wanted to deal with it personally, but suddenly a powerful flash of light blinded him. In a high jump, Chan tried to hit the monster with his pole. Chapter 43 Jay regarded the body of the defeated ant with amazement. He asked the equally surprised young man if he had activated the pole. Chan said he had only read a couple lines from the manual, so he didn't even fully understand how the weapon worked. The mentor then asked how his student was feeling right now. He replied that he was a little out of breath, but he couldn't say he felt very tired. Huang didn't feel any magical energy, most likely the guy was using physical power as a source. It was a rather old mechanism, no big deal, since you also needed to expend some of your strength and energy to maintain the weapon. However, the blow he had seen a few minutes earlier, the result of such power would definitely not be a simple puff of breath. Huang concluded that Chan was just lucky if he hadn't had that thing, the former ranker would have been taught a good lesson and the young man laughed, telling his mentor that this fight could be considered lost. The man informed him that he hadn't even hoped for a different outcome. He sat down in a tree and lit a cigarette, 
explaining that he didn't consider his mentee's abilities to be low, on the contrary, he had good qualities, with his combat power alone reaching the gold level. In all his time, Huang had met no more than a dozen hunters stronger than Chan, and all of them had died because of monsters that were below their rank. Suddenly, a huge elf rose from the ground, it seemed to have the ability to regenerate, healing most injuries. Chan stood in front of it, taking a fighting stance. Suddenly Huang jumped up from his seat, seeing the monster take up the exact same stance, only it didn't have a weapon in its hands. It seems that this monster has the ability to perceive a situation and adjust to it, and the incredible efficiency comes as a bonus. Seeing Chan throwing blow after blow in an unsuccessful attempt to find a weakness, Jay shouted that no matter how powerful the weapon was, it was impossible to defeat this opponent without understanding the basic method of attack, at least not in the time allotted. The mentor jumped down and covered the exhausted boy. Just in case, he asked if he was willing to end the fight and admit defeat. The young man asked what he should have done. After some thought, Huang replied that the best thing to do in such a situation was to run away. The apprentice asked to stop joking, but the man spoke in complete seriousness one had to escape from the enemy and lure him to a place where he could not regenerate. There were three ways in which one could defeat a carnivorous enthus. The first and most effective is to lure it to a place where it cannot absorb nutrients, so that as long as it is on the surface of the ground from which it feeds, it will regenerate without end. A good solution would be to lure the ant onto a cliff or into an abandoned building. However, Chan didn't do that, for he tried to defeat it with the only tactic he knew, find a weak spot and crush it. Suddenly, the monster broke through the barrier and rushed straight for his friends. Huang then explained and demonstrated the second way to deal with the flesh-eating ant, use a fire spell of C-rank or higher. It sounds like nonsense, but this method makes the task much easier than the first one, but by the time Chang realizes it, the monster will create chaos around him. C-rank flames are much more difficult to summon than they sound, because it is impossible to do so with ordinary fire, and even an army bomb is no match for its power. Back in the days before good magic spells, many great hunters had fallen precisely because they didn't know how to fight them. Jay asked the guy how he was feeling, and for sure, his mood was lousy now, because losing to a monster is much more hurtful than to a human, the feeling of regret and loss is much greater than the joy of gaining new knowledge. However, paying for it with a lousy mood is much better than getting hurt or the lives of friends and then feeling like a dog that was lucky to be alive. After making sure his student had learned his lesson, Huang told him to pack his things and asked if Chan could run for an hour or two. The area of the dungeon itself was very different from its nominal boundaries on the outside, what at first glance appeared to be four districts of Seoul and a small island, inside could be compared to the entire Korean peninsula. The scenery here was also quite different. Looking down from the cliff at the breathtakingly beautiful forest, Huang said it was a three-star food chain hell of danger, and alone, Jang would only last about thirty minutes. Now for two weeks the man will train by day and protect the lad by night, but after that period of time everything will remain the same, however at night he will try to survive on his own. If he lasts a month in this mode, he can consider the exam passed, however, if he wants to give up, it is not too late to give up. A smile played on Chan's face, he only regretted such a limited period of time for the test. A month later, a Rolls Royce pulled up to the young man's house and Jean Sae Ram got out. It was already the day to take the exams to move on to the hero school, but he hadn't answered his phone for the entire thirty days. Suddenly, a friend came up to her in tattered clothes, carrying a bag and a pole in his hands. He asked if she had come for him. Rolling her eyes, the pixie asked where he'd been, and more importantly, what he'd been doing there. 